I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will you roll call, please? Dr. Skidmore? Here. Mrs. Matura? Here. Mrs. Greenberg? Here. Mrs. Case? Here. Mrs. Bacon? Here. Next on the agenda is public comment. I will turn it over to Ms. Anderson. You can hear me? How about that? Apologize. Good morning, President Greenberg, Governing Board members, Dr. Welsh, members of Cabinet, and attendees, both in person and virtual. Due to the requirement, is that better? Due to the requirements by the governor to limit large group gatherings as part of our traditional call to the public, we will also be including virtual public comments submitted via the public input form. Due to the Arizona Open Meeting Law, the Governing Board cannot discuss or take action on items not listed on the agenda. Members of the public were encouraged to complete the online comment form by 4 p.m. Thursday, September 17th. As a reminder, the online comment form was included in our message to families on September the 10th, posted on the front page of our website, included in meeting notices, or the meeting notice and agenda, and shared with our stakeholder group leaders. All comments that were received by 4 p.m. yesterday were provided to all governing board members, and they've had the opportunity to read all of the comments submitted. Additionally, the superintendent's office received all of the comments as well and has read through the comments. We'd like to thank our stakeholders for voicing their thoughts and providing input for today's meeting. We received a total of 538 online comment submissions for today's meeting. So that we can value the comments submitted while ensuring sufficient time to conduct our business for this meeting, the total time allotted for public comments will be limited to 90 minutes. Both in-person and submitted comments will be limited to a minute and a half. Public comment will begin with a member of the public physically in attendance and then take turns with comments submitted online until the time for public comment has expended. Altern alternating between comments characterized to support a particular position. A random number generator was used to randomize the order of comments submitted online to be read at this meeting. In cases where the same individual provided duplicate submissions, the most recent comment was included to ensure that all submitters had an equal chance of being selected and read. Dr. Corson and I will be reading the comments submitted online. We apologize in advance for mispronouncing anyone's name. Do you have the cards up there yet, or are they all still? Is there some in the basket there, Sergeant Wilson? Okay. Do we, is it, Ms. Chisholm, do we have 
cards from the public here. No. We only have the. Ms. Anderson, do you want to start with or whoever the first individual was, perhaps? Absolutely. Can everyone hear me okay? Well, actually, I was going to say, since publicly we said we would start with a member who was present, did we have at least one card and we could start with that person? Yes, there was one right I believe we have a card from um, Ms. Steep, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. All right. Um, I'm simply going to do these in no particular order in which I've got them here. And again, we apologize for mispronouncing anybody's name. Uh, Linda Morano. Morano. Hello, board members and Superintendent Welsh. Thank you so much for allowing me this time to speak today. I am the mother of two elementary age school children in Paradise Valley School District. My son is in third grade and has an IEP. My daughter is in fourth grade. Both of my children are struggling. I am not alone in my concerns for the education for my children. As you can see, there are many parents here today, and there are many parents that also showed up at our last rally. My children are not receiving a well-balanced education. My son is not receiving necessary interventions in order for him to succeed. My children's social, emotional, and mental well-being are deteriorating. We as parents rely on the board to make a decision today that will allow our children to go back to the classroom. However, when board members in this committee signed the board norms, they committed to looking out for the welfare of Paradise Valley School District, and it was understood that their role was to ensure that Paradise Valley Schools was well managed, not to manage the district. Yet, here we are today, waiting on pins and needles for a vote from this committee to determine if and when we as parents can send our children to school. We have waited long enough. Our children have waited long enough. I urge you to open the doors of schools today. Many of us are done waiting, and after the decision today that is made here, if not favorable, we will pull our children. Thank you. And the next is the online comment from Jennifer Eisenstark. Thank you for all your hard work and countless hours you have put into schools. This is a payless job and people forget that. We know you all want what is best for our kids. I would love for my kids to be back in class ASAP, as long as they are masked inside only. I don't believe that elementary kids should have them on outside at recess. Middle and high school are just hanging out, so that's fine but the little ones need to have a break and be able to run around without them on their face. I think it's going to cause a huge uproar with parents when they find out their young ones have to be in a mask outside running around. Kids are already at sports and other outside activities and then are masked and haven't had any cases. Like I said, my kids won't be going to school if they aren't masked and others aren't, but I feel completely opposite when outdoors, even if they are not completely social distancing. Thank you. Next is um, Chantel Jones. I wasn't prepared to speak, so forgive me if I ramble. Nice to see you all. Um, we just moved my daughter from Great Hearts, where she's been for seven years. She did well at Great Hearts, but we figured for school, for high school, she needed a normal high school experience. Well, nobody could have foreseen COVID. Um, 
And while she already has a really good work ethic, work ethic instilled, so her grades are fine, she's sad. She hasn't had a chance to meet the friends in our new school. She said to me the other day, and she's going to get mad at me for saying this, but she said to me the other day, she said, nothing is fun anymore. I don't want to get out of bed because I'm just going to get in this, sit in a chair and listen online for eight hours. If there was real imminent danger, I might be a little bit more understanding, but the death rate for people under 55 is negligible. The death rate for people over 55 with no underlying medical conditions is also negligible. I'm not saying everybody needs to go back, but I'm saying we need a choice, and those who can should. Thank you. The next one is from Jessica Lilly. First, let me acknowledge that this is a very trying year and the extra time you're putting into the board is appreciated. You are having to make tough decisions and you can't please everyone. That said, I'm writing to plead with you to please find a way to get creative and open our schools. 70% of our families that have been surveyed have said they want their kids back in school. Even if some of those families will only go back if they are in the green they have two options for staying on distance learning until they are comfortable going back in person. Right now, there is no option for families wanting to go back. Families that want to go back know the risk, know that it won't be normal. They know that kids will be masked and spending lots of time washing hands and learning this new way of going to school. COVID has changed life as we know it, and it's time to find a way to live with it. Our district has the benefit of learning from other districts that have already gone back to in person. Let's learn from them. Let's take the best practices and implement them. Our young learners are suffering, suffering with online learning, not only from an emotional and social standpoint, but their love of learning is not being instilled from online learning. They are not getting the base of their learning that we build on every year. Despite the best efforts from our teachers, online learning does not work for young elementary students. The metrics you set for our district aren't achievable. It was stated last night that we might not ever reach those metrics. The doctor that spoke was wrong in saying New York had hit those metrics. They haven't. Thank you. Next is Christine Malaysia. And again, I apologize as well if I'm just Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I also didn't expect to speak today, but um, I feel really strongly about all children. I do have a senior in the district, um, but I wanted to talk about was children's mental health. I work for La Frontera Impact Behavioral Health in the Children's Department. I am the liaison to the Arizona Department of Child Safety for La Frontera Impact. I work very closely with them um, on their cases and getting services for children. But right now, um, we had seen the cases since March go down. And the reason was that there weren't any teachers to make reports on behalf of the children. So the cases that are coming in right now to the department are among the worst. They're mostly being made from the hospitals when it has escalated to that level, or from the police department when it has escalated to that level. But there's nobody there to catch it on the lower level. So the children being in person, it's a safer place for them, and it also keeps them safe from other outside influences. So we really would like a choice for our children and our families to be able to go back to school. And it's not just for all of the reasons mentioned, their mental health is definitely of utmost importance too. Thank you. Okay, the next online is from uh, Danita Hall. Please consider providing consistency with PV Connect. We would like to remain online even while you are offering in-person learning, but do not want the disruption with switching electives or teachers or schools. Thank you for all you are doing to keep our family safe. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Breckner. Uh, thank you. Um, I just first I want to say like I, I watched that four hour um, board meeting from last night, and I can tell that all of you just care so deeply. I don't envy your position. Um, it's a such a difficult position, and the, all these parents are right. It's so hard 
Um, and I thought that my points might be beneficial to you because um, I know a lot of teachers who are actually on the ground and what they've experienced in the schools that have reopened, uh, both at Great Hearts and the Cape Creek School District. And uh, in my master's program, I've talked to, to teachers across the board. So I thought that, well, I'm, I'm, I miss my kids and I want kids to come back. It's such a challenging situation, and we just, um, I just thought this information would be important for you. Um, as you may already kind of know uh, from talking with all of them and uh, to the people at Great Hearts and at uh, Cape Creek, uh, there's just really no social distancing that's happening. It's, it's, it's too hard for kids. They're just not cognitively in that spot. So um, while trying to sit in rows and being in in masks and stuff like that where we try to do that a lot of teachers are spend, spending a really a long time and a lot of their stress and energy is focused on trying to maintain these safe distances and the safe protocols so they're spending a lot of time on this um the uh there has been breakouts at every school that i've talked to um so which is i'm sorry the that's your time. We've limited it to a minute and a half. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Um, the last thing I mentioned is there's been mass resignings at every of all of our schools, which is going to be hard for us as well. So I don't, it's a difficult situation. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, the next online comment is from Jennifer Story. We deserve the choice for our children. If you are not willing to give us the decision for our own children, your board and Dr. Welsh are part of today's problems with society. Your decisions are based on money, not the children. You can quote science as your reasoning, but we all know. You can pull data from any source you want, but even though cases will continue to be positive, the death rate is minimal, especially amongst school-age children. One of the most essential jobs there is, is a teacher. Target, Walmart, Walmart Great Wolf, Wolf Lodge, professional sports, hair, nail salons, restaurants are more essential than teachers in schools. Not even close, but they are all open. At first, I felt this distance learning was the hardest on my first grader, but it turns out my fifth grader is finding it even tougher. She is an A and B student. However, progress reports last Friday have her with D's and C's. We couldn't have been more shocked. She wants to give up with daily tears and extreme confusion and frustration. She is on the shy side and will not ask questions online with the entire class present. This has made her eternalize her thoughts, feelings, and frustrations. Online learning is not only teaching my is not only not teaching my children, it is progressing them down a self-conscious sense of failure. As a parent, I know some of this is normal for a 10-year-old, but is now on the extreme. I have videos of extreme outbursts that I do not want to share out of the respect for my children, but it's heartbreaking to say the least. I can also understand. Um, sorry. Ethan Fitzsimmons. Good morning. As mentioned, my name is Ethan Fitzsimons. My wife and I recently moved to the district primarily for the schools. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts. Respected representatives and board members, during these unprecedented times, I feel compelled to share my thoughts as a concerned citizen and more importantly, parent of two children involved, enrolled in the Paradise Valley School District. My daughters are in second grade and kindergarten at Sonoran Sky. First off, please afford me the opportunity to commend the effort, empathy, and patience that both of their teachers have shown during the initial weeks of school. While dealing with never before seen circumstances, they're both striving to overcome and provide the best learning environment possible for the children and their classrooms. This is leadership we can all learn from. They have been faced with a challenge they never expected, planned for, or wanted. Rather than focusing on the unknown, what they cannot control, they have focused on what they can you will face the same challenge. This has never before been experienced in the world. To date, my kindergartner has spent 10% of her life in lockdown. My second grader, 7% of her life in lockdown. It's taking an immeasurable toll on her education, mental well-being, and overall perspective of the world. They cry because they feel alone and detached from other children. Technology fails, and they don't have the tools to understand it's not their fault. Their age doesn't afford them the perspective to understand this won't last forever. So in their minds, it does. 
I ask you to step up the same way your teachers have and return our children to full-time in-person learning October 5th to grow, learn, and regain the childhood the virus has attempted to take away. And, and the next for online is Stacy Rogan. In considering the various options for returning to school, I would like to urge the board to consider having the PV Connect run simultaneously with in-person class. This means that a web camera would be running of the class so that it would be like people are people are online were participating with the class. I prefer this model because it gives the students a continuity of education. They remain in the same class with the same teachers and procedures. It also enables students that might need to stay home for COVID quarantine or other illnesses to be able to continue class without missing 14 days of class. I'd also ask that schools seek out safe ways that the children can go mask-free for some period of time, maybe plexiglass or plastic dividers between students, or permitting the removal of masks in classes that have six feet of space between students. I would also urge the schools to set thresholds for being able to eliminate the masks, and likewise set limits for exposure. For example, if X number of students test positive during a certain amount of time, the school returns online for 30 days to help prevent an explosion of cases within the school. Lisa Fire. I just want to say that your number one job as board members is the educational welfare of our students. And I do not feel you're doing your job. You ha and it's for all the children. This is not just about the young children. All the children are equally affected by this. And you are putting our district behind the other districts and other schools across the country. We are gonna be far behind all the other districts in, in, this, in this state and across the country. You're hurting our children. And Dr. Welsh, it's your job to be prepared for this. We shouldn't need weeks after this to get us back into class. I don't even understand the need to stagger it. Why are we not prepared now? That is your job, proactive planning. And the board, please, you have got to look after our children. What you're doing is not right. You cannot just make decisions based on your personal biases. Your job is to represent our children and the constituents in this district. The majority want to go back to school. We deserve that right, and we need to uphold your responsibilities. The next one is from Anna Brini Subramania. Manian. Respected board, we are thankful for all the efforts the entire team has put thus far for DL. We request you to continue the same so that the quality does not go down. The Great Parks Academy at North Phoenix opened their doors and in a week, a teacher in sixth grade tested positive for COVID. We have to learn from our surrounding. We love our teachers and I cannot see this happen. Please don't feel pressurized by parents nor politically as well. I am very sure you understand that this is a pandemic and it will take time. In a lifespan, one or two years wouldn't be so much to endure this. I request you to make informed decisions. Again, I salute all teachers and administrators, every single one, for all their continuous efforts to meet parents' needs in these testing times. Thank you. Hey, um, the next part I have is from Tina Stevens, but it looks like you want to address the agenda item. So do you want to wait until... It, it's up to you because you haven't noted it as agenda item. I don't. I didn't know what to do, so I just hear for this issue, the school closure, and I guess going back. So I mean, it's, it is completely up to you. If you would like to say it now, that's fine. If you want it, okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Tina Stevens. I have a 16-year-old at uh, North Canyon and a 10-year-old at Cole Run. And while my daughter is doing okay academically, she is not so much emotionally. My son is having the most horrible time um, being in school at home. It's not in the environment of learning. A lot of our days don't end until bedtime at 9 p.m. So we're doing school from 8.40 in the morning to 9 p.m. at night, almost every single day. Because we're at the mercy of the internet. And when Cox doesn't work, he can't get on school. 
And when he can't get back home to school, then we're spending our whole entire night catching up on what should have been done in school during the day. That is not fun for any 10-year-old. It's not fun for me as an adult. Um, we can't get other things done because our whole day is trying to get school done. We're trying to find assignments. They're everywhere. It's, it's just a mess. Poor teachers are trying their hardest, too, so it's not their fault they're doing with what you guys have given them to do. Their kids have got to go back. We know the success rate doesn't deserve this level of um, freaking out. It just really doesn't. Precautions can be taken for those who want them. And then for us who want to go back, we should have that choice to go back. So just ask you to let them go back, please. Thank you. The next one is Richard Starr. You should be, you should explicitly, explicitly state the number of cases that equal 10 cases per week per 100,000 people. I think the district has about 260,000 people, so we're talking only 26 cases per week. That's not very many. Last two weeks, I believe the district boundary has had about 76 and 81 cases. And the last card I have is Michelle Akamuzi. And again, I apologize if I mispronounced. Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to speak. I have two students at Pinnacle Peak Preparatory Academy, one in fourth grade and one in second grade. They have both tested gifted and are extremely uh, social students. We have been struggling at home not only to maintain a quiet household that is conducive for learning, but we have also been struggling to keep up with curriculum as both parents are essential workers. My son's name is William and he is a second grader with Mrs. Hornbeck. She is an amazing teacher and doing her best to keep her class engaged. Over the past month of school being in session, William's PD Learners account has been kicking him offline an average of 20 times per day. Some days we are unable to log into the meeting at all, which has caused him to miss a total of four days of school. I have watched my son not only cry, but curl up into a ball on the couch with a broken heart because he is unable to stay in class. William is not only a gifted learner, but he genuinely loves school. He is a social kid. He thrives in groups of children and loves to play foursquare with his friends at recess. As a parent, I am seeing a decline in his interest in school and part of his childhood is being lost. He is irritable, bored, and misses his classmates and teachers terribly. This is a very challenging situation for the families of Pinnacle Peak Prep who want their children back in school. The harm we are causing to our children by keeping our schools closed is immeasurable. This not only poses a significant threat to mental health, academic achievement in both the long term and short term, but also poses a threat to our most vulnerable and lower income families. As you make your decision, ask yourself if you're doing your job. Thank you. The next one is from Bridget Solomon. We should not open in-person school until there is a vaccine at the very least until January. Let's see how the numbers look in a few weeks since some schools are in person. We will know a lot more then. Do you have any more in person? Thank you. Uh, the next one is from Jay Robinson. I am in support of my children going back to in-person learning immediately. The benefits clearly outweigh the harms attributed to closed schools, including social, emotional, and behavioral health and economic well-being and the short and long-term academic achievement of children. The lack of in-person education options also, dis options also disproportionately affect children in K through three and those with disabilities who are still developing the skills to regulate their own behavior, attention, and emotions, and as a result, struggle with distance learning. I am witnessing firsthand the devastation to our children this environment is inflicting, and I'm sure that I am not alone. Please do not delay opening our schools any further and provide a strong online option for those parents and teachers who are not comfortable going back to school. Victoria Carlock. This school year has been full of ups and downs, and I'm sure you are receiving an incredible amount of pressure to reopen schools. I also understand the pressure you have been getting is often hostile and disrespectful. I want to take a moment to say thank you, and thank you so much for the tireless amount of work you are doing to keep our community safe and healthy. Thank you for approaching, approaching the reopening of schools during this pandemic with insight, caution, and integrity. 
You are appreciated by my family and so many others that I know. I can only imagine the challenges you are facing. Our experience with virtual school at Pinnacle Peak Prep has been wonderful. My first grader is happy, healthy, and learning every day through virtual learning. My son's teacher has been nothing short of incredible, and he, is abso and he absolutely adores her. I know there might be changes on the horizon with regards to reopening of schools, but we plan to continue virtual learning for the foreseeable future. While we hope to keep my son's current teacher, we understand that this is a pandemic, and for us, the time is now to be flexible. Thank you again for your tireless work to the board, staff, teachers, administrators, etc. You are greatly appreciated. As a mom of three, my daughter's education, oh, I'm sorry, this is from Kylie Bird. As a mom of three, my daughter's education is the most important thing to me. That being said, children are not only educated by teachers, but also by peers and experiences. My children are missing out on so many important life lessons that every child needs. My children need to go back in school, in person, keeping them out longer than they already have been will be so detrimental to their educational and social emotional growth. This has gone on long enough. My kids are ready to go back to school. They need to be back in school. The next one is Michael Walker. I would ask PVUSD to reconsider the criteria for the number of cases this week, 30.93, last week, 28.29, needed to return to school. The recommendation from Maricopa County for PVUSD with these numbers is for hybrid with on-site support. Deer Valley, where my granddaughter is, goes, is opening starting 824 and their numbers are very close to ours. To be under 10 per 100,000 may be difficult to achieve. Thanks for your consideration. This one is from Jenny Lewis. What will be the protocol if there is exposure to a student or teacher who tests positive or has family that tests positive. Will students be quarantined and or have the ability to stay home and learn online? If students are penalized for missing school and do not have options to not get behind them, th to not get behind, then there is more risk they won't stay home. Same with teachers. Will they have the ability to stay home if, potentially ex if potential exposure and teach from home in order to not use up sick days? This one is from Eric Evans. I have two children at Boulder Creek Elementary. My kids were supposed to be tested into the gifted cluster this year, but instead they have been crying almost every day because they hate going to online school. This happens to just about every parent I've talked to with tons of people reporting the same with their kids who used to love going to school. I know this is not an easy decision, but especially now that schools are open, it's time to give it a chance. Thanks. Stuart Selden, thank you for continuing to let the health data drive your decisions around in-person learning rather than other influences. My four-year-old in pre-K is getting much better at remote learning and managing it on his own. Keep up the good work. Carrie Crisp, the kids need to be back in school. The CDC and health officials have stated it is safe to return and we remain the only district to not reopen school. If some families want to stay with online learning, then let them. But for everyone else, we have a right to choose to put our kids in classes. Lee Raper, Rapper. The teachers and staff have done a wonderful job at educating our students. They are doing their best in the face of adversity and no doubt working countless hours. I know because I'm a teacher of fourth, grade, my, fourth graders myself. But we have to admit that this isn't working. Maybe for some parents it is, but for the vast majority it is not. Please open the schools for in-person learning. Majority of the parents wish to return to school while the families with health concerns will still have the choice to stay home. Right now, my son who is in your LAS program at Copper Canyon is not being serviced per his IEP. I have to pay the Boys and Girls Club, excuse me, I have to pay the Boys and Girls Club to watch my son in their facilitated learning program because the free care that PD is providing will not allow my son to stay past his synchronous learning time. 
enough to cover, sorry, uh, to attend a small group or therapies via Zoom in the afternoons. I had to ask my family to help me cover the cost of this service because as a teacher, I do not make enough to cover that extra expense myself. I teach at school that has been open for three weeks. I assure you it can be done safely and successfully. With the County of Maricopa and Arizona's numbers trending down, it is irresponsible to keep children, especially younger and special needs children out of school. Most other districts have a plan to open. Even the CDC says that it is of the utmost importance for students to return to school. The CDC claims that school is an integral part of the community. Yes, that Dr. Corson will switch in just a sec. We just broke it up. And the last one from my section, uh, Jennifer Croning. Our students have been out of the classroom for more than six months. The ongoing closure of schools is having a significant negative impact on our students' education, mental health, and physical health. Our teachers are working tirelessly to teach and connect with students online. While they have been amazing and creative at finding ways to present their lessons, their efforts cannot produce the same results as teaching students in person. The district's adopted benchmarks and plans for reopening schools are not reasonable. Dr. Welch reported that it is unlikely we are going to reach 10 cases per 100,000 any time in the foreseeable future. It is time to revise the plan to return to the classroom. The state and county have re recommended for our schools to move to a hybrid learning format, which includes students learning in the classroom. The state and county have made the hybrid learning format flexible to allow for districts to customize the format to the specific needs of their community. Please support a reopening plan that provides students the choice to return to in-person learning no later than October 5th and supports online learning for those students that prefer to continue online. Other schools in our community have reopened successfully. I am confident that PD schools can reopen successfully as well. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Carson. The next comment is from Audrey Dorn. I really hope to go back to school ASAP. I have been struggling in school during online. I can never stay focused and I have barely learned anything. That is awful. I feel like I have not been productive whatsoever. Priscilla Pawlowski, please consider reopening the school for quarter two. Metrics across the country and the state and our district are supporting a healthy environment. While my older kids, fifth and sixth grade are surviving this, my first grade are struggling and I can, as a working full-time parent, am struggling keeping up with the work and supporting my daughter. Thank you. Debbie Miller, I've had a child in the Paradise Valley School District for over 23 years, three kids. I would love to have my high schooler back in school, but our school pinnacle is so overcrowded that there's no way to follow the guidelines. I support any decision you make, but sending 3,000 kids back to school that is grossly overcrowded is a recipe for disaster. I think Notre Dame Prep has it right. Split the kids in half, hybrid, so it is safe for everyone. Please don't let the bullies drown out the rest of us. Keep schools closed until it is safe for everyone. Thanks for all the work you do. Nicholas Velez. Please reopen in-person attendance for PV School District. Several school districts in Arizona allow in-person attendance. Heather Salerno. I have to clarify my feelings about the survey sent out for returning to in-school, uh, in, to in-person learning. I selected to stay in Connect regardless of the changes, but the surveys were very limited in scope. When the metrics as discussed are met, I will consider returning my students to in-person classes, but not if the metric guidelines are changed, as some are asking for. I also need further detail about cleaning and sanitation procedures, mask protocols, and consequences for non-compliance, lunch procedures, and moving between classes. Thank you. Kelly Wirt, I would like to ask you to return all grades in person ASAP based on the response to the parent surveys that were sent out. If a family is in favor of in person, open the doors and allow the kids to return. I make this request on behalf of the severe mental toll this is having on all three of my children in fourth, seventh, and ninth grade, and many other children alike. The challenges we are facing to manage their mental health are becoming more difficult the longer they are home. Severe anxiety, irrational fears, emotional meltdowns, outbursts, depression, withdrawal, not participating in class, 
missing assignments, failing tests, low self-esteem, and so much more are all direct effects of the virtual learning model for my children. My students would be much more engaged, doing better in their classes and not having constant emotional distress if they could be in the classroom environment which they thrive in. I beg of you to allow us parents the opportunity to choose what we feel is best for our families and let us assume the risk of choosing to send them back in person rather than making a blanket decision for everyone. It is my belief that their mental health is a greater risk of long-term effects than those of COVID, and the best solution to prevent this is getting them back in person. Thank you for your consideration. Nina Harlow, I'm writing to the governing board as one of the families who was forced to leave PVUSD due to a lack of in-person choices. While I am so relieved to see my children happy, healthy, and thriving with in-person instruction, it is extremely frustrating to know that so many families who are also desperate for in-person choices with PBUSD are not, be, are not being given that opportunity. Schools can safely reopen now for those who wish to return. The vast majority of both teachers and families are ready to return, and those who are not ready have the option to continue online. All surrounding districts have either already safely opened or communicated their dates for opening. While I would have hoped PB could be the leader here, it's not too late to be the fast follower for the sake of our children's education and mental health. Let's start putting politics and fear aside and look at the science and facts that are demonstrating clear evidence that an in-person option must be offered now. Michael Gutman, Open Our Schools. Kim Steffen. At our August 6th governing board meeting, in alignment with the governing board uh, with Governor Ducey's most recent executive order, we adopted reopening criteria for in-person learning that align closely with the recommendations provided by the Arizona Department of Health Services. To help make it easier to understand, we are using a traffic signal description. Uh, a green light signal to return to in-person based on the 14-day average and testing positivity below 5% and daily case less than 10 per 100,000 population. I implore you to stick to that original metric of green light in person. Do not change the metrics now because people want to go back to in-person learning. Do not rush in-person learning just because parents are ready for kids to go back. Norma Ramirez, after your study session, I agree that we can start a hybrid system according to the metrics. Gradual return is an effective way to go back to campus. It gives the school, staff, and teachers the opportunity to gradually get used to the new system and test the safety measures. Special education, K-7, 9 grade should go first at the same time. Also, there are parents that have not completed the survey because they cannot decide what to do until you give them a date and the reopening safety measures and conditions. We need to know that all of that before we make a definitive, definite decision to send our children back to school. Thank you for your concerns and giving much thought to every situation that can emerge when students go back in person. Brittany Bars, open the expletive schools. Benchmarks are met. You are corrupting our children and making them suffer. Arizona has a terrible education system because of people like you. Brandy Guthrie, I like having the choice for homeschool. I plan on keeping my two children home until we have a vaccine. I don't see an issue carefully placing a small percentage of children back in schools for families who need it. Single moms, abusive parents, special needs, food needs, etc. My main concern is for the safety of the teachers, students, and families. Keep it in mind, there are no do-overs once there is a coronavirus outbreak. Jamie Davis. Please begin bringing kids back to campus. They need the option for in-person learning. Jessica Chaplick, please reconsider your metrics. My children deserve to go back to school in person just as those who wish to keep their children home to do online school. I'm not asking for this to be taken away. While their teachers are doing their best online, this is not the ideal circumstances or many that I'm aware of. Kids are struggling learning Parents are struggling with full-time jobs, all while other schools and districts are allowing for in-person learning. I will be moving my children out of this district if they are not in school by the start of the second quarter. 
it is safe for school sports to begin, why is it not safe for in-person learning? My children are struggling and our financials are struggling because of my working from home while my kids are out of school. I am begging you to reconsider. Lent demands. Children need to be back to school. Pre-K through third grade need to be able to learn in person. I believe all children should be in person as soon as possible. Children are not the risk in COVID, but they are at risk for mental health issues, isolation, and emotional issues with such a long online-only presence. Sunny and Adam Reich. I feel compelled to contribute my thoughts to this forum because I know that there is a vocal group of parents and community members who are demanding the schools be reopened immediately. While I hear the concerns that PB may be using stricter measures to reopen, I know that this is inaccurate and that PBUSD is following the metrics provided to all schools in Maricopa County, but has opted to not reopen in a hybrid model. I also hear calls to follow in the steps of Scottsdale as they have plans to reopen, and I have seen their hybrid model, which I understand was rejected by parents once they were surveyed, as it created a logistical nightmare for parents and still presented exposure risk. I, like all parents, want the best for my kids. I, like all parents, struggle with the situation that we are in daily. We are working full time while trying to help our pre-K and second grade students with school, in addition to caring for our two-year-old. This is no way ideal, but we are making it work, and I understand that we are all fortunate to be able to do so. I value the health and safety of myself, my family, and our other wonderful teachers and staff, and I will be gladly, without hesitation, continue to have my daily life be a little more difficult or to be inconvenienced temporarily rather than have even one person from our school community die. That is what is at stake. I am troubled by the statement in the survey that was sent that there was an inability to meet the requirements of physical distancing. I am troubled by the statement made. Raina Wallace, please send our children back into the classroom every day. The emotional toll is taken on my son is far riskier than the COVID virus. Peggy Smith. Thank you to each and every one of you that are making tough decisions on behalf of the community. My kinder child was originally enrolled at Scottsdale Charter School until the end, uh, until the end July. After listening to both PV reopening plans and the charter school, I opted to choose PV instead, and I enrolled him in Fireside Elementary. I chose PV because of the strict safety precautions, and I believe in the curriculum and educational investment of PV schools. I am a product of the district and only attend PV schools from elementary through high school. During the July-August time frame, I was adamant and ready to keep my kinder on PV Connect for as long as PV deemed it was safe. My child is currently doing as best as he can learning virtually, and the teachers have been amazing. However, it is not the same as live in-person learning. My thoughts of remaining virtual have now changed. This is a fluid environment and we must learn to be flexible, adaptable, and creative. There will not be right decision to suit everyone's wishes and please all parents. However, please provide us with some options. I'm asking the board to please consider providing an option to return, especially for the younger kids who are trying to read and write. These basic skills are the root of their education and is a necessity for continued educational success. Please reconsider changing the PV metrics threshold and provide an option for those families wishing to return. Waiting for classes to drop to 10 out of 100,000 is a big ask. Rachel Jimenez, I am writing you today to share my opinions on reopening. I am absolutely looking forward to the day I get to see my students in person. It has been extremely difficult for all involved to teach and learn online. However, I currently do not feel it is safe for students or staff to return to school without both of the proposed metrics being met. There are still so many unanswered questions as to what it looks like when we return to school without meeting these metrics. As a classroom teacher, it is going to be extremely difficult to follow the PB prepared requirements and be able to teach my students while also managing behaviors. If we have this long list of safety requirements that have to be followed, it is, is it even safe to come back in person? I have many concerns surrounding an in-school return at this time. Where will our students play in the mornings when they get to school before 845? 
How will we find subs to teach our classes should we need the day off? What happens when we have teachers resign because they cannot put themselves or their family members at risk? How will we find teachers to fill these positions? Our students have been able to develop relationships with their teachers for the past six, six weeks during virtual learning. Teachers and students alike will be devastated if they have to leave their profession due to the reason. It will cause a huge disruption in their learning and that will leave the other grade level teachers to train the new teacher if one can be found. I feel it necessary to wait until we have scientific based evidence to show that it is safe to return in person. We are putting the lives. Michelle? Uh, Jamie McLeod, just wondering what the procedure will be if we do not have enough teachers. I would rather have my child home safe than at school in a room with a computer like Hack the Shadows did on their first day. Thank you for all you do. Stephanie Kabaiko would like schools to reopen ASAP. Hera Dembowski, I want my kids to go back to school when it's safe to do so. I don't think we will ever meet all three metrics. Only 100 cases per 100,000 may be un unattainable. To me, it makes sense to go back at second quarter with as many safeguards in place as the district will provide. Please ensure teachers and staff are safe and provide them with proper PPE. In terms of testing, I do want to point out something mentioned last night. Right now, a person does not need to test negative before returning to school after the 10 days after symptoms and a positive test. It's likely that a person will never test negative for COVID once he or she is positive. You would need to check for antibodies to determine that the person has already had and recovered from COVID. Therefore, a negative test should not be required. It is much more symptom-based, although only 24 hours without fever seems too short. I would prefer 72 hours like we do at the hospital. I admire the governing board and, the super and Superintendent Walsh for continuing to fight for safety of teachers and the kids. Morgan Troutman, with the number of cases being so low and more than a 99% recovery rate, there is absolutely no reason to keep schools closed. Our students are not getting the proper education, services, and attention they need and deserve. With proper hand washing, good nutrition, exercise, vitamin C, and D, we can all return to school and work safely. Bryn Livingston, thank you for your Thank you for reconsidering the metrics PB is using. The metrics were set by expert scientists and epidemi epidemiologists, yes. However, the metrics were created in a utopian vacuum that just considers viral spread alone when there are so many other things to consider with schools and education. They don't account for all of the other impacts of the virus like the psychosocial effects of social isol isolation the widening economic gap and the uh, um, atrophy of knowledge. I have a degree in science, science and medicine and can appreciate science and data, but also realize that sometimes theoretical science is not always practical in application. I agree with the other medical professionals referenced in the study session that the metrics are not attainable for the foreseeable future and we should not wait to open schools for those ready to return. The other consideration regarding the metrics is that, quote, green zone recommendations by the CDC and Maricopa County are for a full return to school without masking. So to consider in-person learning in the yellow while also asking everyone to mask up for, the, for mitigation would not be going against the recommended metrics, especially since there will be some that opt to continue learning at home, creating a natural hybrid situation. Some other districts have started in-person learning. We have not seen increasing outbreaks and our percent positivity numbers are remaining very stable. This helps evidence. Andrea Smith. Dear Governing Board, I currently have two daughters, kindergartner and second grader attending a PB school. We are new to the district and so far are not pleased. We need to return to in-person school now before our children are damaged more than they have already been. I am extremely, I extremely frustrating with the way the board has handled the return to school. Let's, let's stop making this political and start thinking of our children. We have met the government's benchmarks to return in person. Why have you still not come up with a plan? This is ridiculously that we are still doing online learning when other districts are returning to school. Restaurants, movie theaters, bars, gym, and a private school are 
opening with no problems? Why can't the district be preparing the schools for return? Why do we need to keep discussing returning and just return already? Elementary children are not meant to be doing online learning. My children cry every day in frustration. It's emotionally damaging to these children. They may be retaining about 10% of what they are learning. We are also constantly having technical problems. I appreciate all that the teachers are doing, but it is not enough. Please let them get back in person to school. Angela Mayo. Mayo. My son attends Desert Trails Elementary and I indicated plans to send him back. That is provided that we either meet the green metrics or there is some sort of hybrid if we remain in the yellow as it was clear social distancing was not going to be possible. I did not mean I want him in the classroom regardless of metrics, but it appears reasonably safe to do so. I would like him to go back. Ava Milski, I want to go back to school as soon as possible. I miss seeing my teachers and friends and having human interactions in a regular high school experience. Lynn Schaefer, I know we are hoping for in-person learning for families who feel it's important for the situation they are in. I just don't think many parents and students realize that school that was happening last February, February will not be what school is like this year. When we get a group of people together, germs are exchanged. It happens every school year and it will happen again this year, even with extra hand washing stations and mandatory masks. Now these cold viruses and flu viruses appear as COVID-19 symptoms and will constantly be prohibiting effective in-person learning from happening. The constant switch from in-person to virtual learning makes it challenging for teachers and staff, parents and daycare providers, and most importantly, the students. Right now, the wording for PV Connect makes it sound as though we who have chosen that safe, safer option must prepare for teacher and possibly school changes, and I feel that's the wrong approach. If we indeed have many teachers who are wary of returning to in-person and many families who are able to remain in PV Connect, I think we should highlight that and make it so that those students stay with their teachers and do not get shuffled around. The families that prefer in-person learning, as spotty as that may be, should be the ones who should have to prepare for the shuffle of teachers to be partnered with those who want to go back to in-person teaching. Amy Lance. I strongly feel that students should go back to school for face-to-face -face instruction. My children are lacking their classes due to spotty connections, lack of direction, and overall disinterest in school. I have concerns that they are not receiving the foundations needed to stay within the benchmarks regarded at each grade level. Please open the schools up so my children can attend classes and receive the education they deserve. It breaks my heart that they are in tears more often than, than not due to the stress and complications of online learning. Scott Carney, respected representatives and board members. During these unprecedented times, I feel compelled to share my thoughts as a concerned citizen and more importantly, parent of two children enrolled in the Paradise Valley School District. My daughter and son are in the fifth and first grades of Pinnacle Peak Elementary, respectively. First off, please afford me the opportunity to commend the effort, empathy, and patience that both of their teachers have shown during the initial weeks of school. While dealing with never before seen circumstances, they are both striving to overcome and provide the best learning environment possible for the children in their classrooms. I believe this is a leadership that we can all learn from. They have been faced with a challenge that was never expected, planned for, or frankly wanted. Rather than focusing on the unknown and what they cannot control, they have focused on what they can. Inherently, you face the same challenges. This is an unprecedented event, not previously experienced in the world. To date, my kids have spent the last six months of their life in some version of a lockdown. It has taken an immeasurable toll on their education, mental well-being, and perspective of the world. They cry because they feel alone and detached from the other children. Technology fails, and they don't have the tools to understand it's not their fault. Their age doesn't afford them the perspective to understand this won't last forever, and therefore in their minds it does. You did not expect this responsibility when you accepted your roles, but you now have it just like the teachers you lead. They have admirably stepped up and I hope you will do the same and return our children to full-time in person. Tim Wiederhoft. We have numerous friends and relatives that are teachers or school administrators. 
people who go into this line of work understand that this is about the children and that their safety and security is a, a top concern. Without your ability to guarantee my child's safety from COVID-19, why would we allow them to attend in-person classes? Our viewpoint would be that the school system, if requiring students to come back in person prior to a cure, vaccine, or treatment should be liable for our children if they were to be put in a position of harm. Just like schools who do not safeguard against violence from students, COVID-19 is a threat that the schools should take seriously and safeguard against. The student's care and well-being while on property is your liability. Many people have and continue to have online classrooms and the ability to utilize technology is only going to increase during our children's lifetime. So the argument of not everyone learns well online is ridiculous. If a student doesn't learn well in classrooms, easily distracted by other kids, etc., you don't consider taking everyone out of the classroom to online. So why would we consider it when it is reversed? This is a no brainer situation. The student should remain online until there is an ability to control the health issue. If there is no health issue, then why is our country still under a state of emergency regarding the health crisis of COVID-19? We all want to get back to something resembling normal life, but there's nothing normal about putting our children at risk, even if it is a small risk. Kevin McCormick. The threat of COVID to students and teachers is less than the flu at this time. If CDC guidelines are followed, the school environment will be safe, safest in the history from a medical standpoint. It's time for everyone to get back to school. Janine Ryan Franzen. My name is Janine Ryan Franzen. I teach science and social studies at Mountain Trail Middle School's new Journey Gifted program. I'm a graduate of PB schools. Both of my parents are retired PB educators, and I have a seventh grader attending Mountain Trail Middle School. I feel strongly that our district should only reopen to in-person instruction once their originally set metrics have been met. To do otherwise would jeopardize the safety of not only our most vulnerable students and staff, but would set the precedent that our district ignores science in the interest of public opinion. Paradise Valley has a long history of innovation. We are visionaries that other districts look to as examples. We need to let the scientists guide the decisions about when to reopen, not the loudest and boldest protesters. I am concerned that we would even consider re I am concerned that we would even consider reopening our schools when we do not have the rapid COVID test or a saliva testing partnership with ASU, an online system communicating the number of positive COVID cases in our schools. We do not have various purchase to protect those who have pre-existing conditions. We are solely relying on masks, which very, which are very ineffective, which vary in effectiveness based on the type worn. Unfortunately, we will see terrible inequities begin to emerge upon reopening schools too soon. Schools north of the 101 with the, their powerful and generous PTOs will have many of the supplies that both teachers and students need. Jennifer Walthrop. We are very excited for the reopening of our schools. As a mom of three, a sophomore at Horizon, a seventh grader at DSMS, and a first grader at DSES, I have seen the emotional struggles they are now facing with such a long period away from an in-person learning environment. Please take into consideration the emotional metric of our children as you make decisions that affect so many. I wish this was an actual metric that was being used for your decision. Give us the opportunity to choose to send our children back and not keep this option from us. Praying for your decisions. <clears throat> Nicole Work. When is PB bringing the kids back to school in person like every other district has already detailed? Lindsay Sweeting. Please reopen the schools. Our kids at Paradise Valley School District are at a huge disadvantage compared to other districts who are attending in person. Kelly Roberson. Roberson. Students with IEPs slash 504 plans should be first priority to get back in the classroom. These students have individualized education plans that cannot be met virtually. They typically have fewer coping skills as well as need face-to-face -face interaction and teaching in order to learn. If 70% of parents are ready to send their students back, then allow them that choice. The other 30% can stay home. 
We just want a choice. Magdalena said, Zamar, I fully support return to in-person learning. In-person learning is essential not only for academic growth of my child, but also and even more crucially to his mental and emotional well-being. As a parent of, only, of an only child, high school freshman, I cannot stress enough how critical it is for my son to have the opportunity to return to in-person learning. Parents and students fully understand the risks associated with COVID-19 and the importance of taking necessary precautions such as wearing a mask and maintaining physical distance. Other students in other districts and states have already returned to in-person learning and are practicing safe measures. Our schools and our students deserve the same. Please let our students return to school. Keeping them home in front of electronic devices is prompting depression and apathy. Enough is enough. We need to live our lives since COVID is not going away anytime soon. Um, we had um, a late request, uh, a late yellow card coming, Michelle Stewart, and then Ms. Stewart, when you're finished, if you could finish filling out the, the info. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, board and Dr. Welsh. I have two students in the district. They are high excelling and you will lose them. I've got a high school junior who has received m multiple awards from Superintendent Welsh for her academic status, and she's in the superintendent book here at the district. She is a high performer in the Step on Stage program at Horizon High School, made all state show choir her sophomore year. She has had straight A's since fourth grade in the honors program throughout PV School District. You will lose her if she is not given the ability to go back by the start of second quarter. I have a seventh grader at Desert Shadows Middle School who has been accepted and is in the Engineering Academy at Desert Shadows. She's also in the Bravo Academy. She was in the self-contained gifted program at Sonoran Sky. You will lose her. I point this out because these are the stars of your school district. My older daughter's in the top 5% of Horizon High School. She could very well be valedictorian. You will lose her. She's up for national honors, merit scholarships. You will lose her. Those are gems in your crowns, and you are going to lose the top performing students in your district if you do not allow them to go back to school in person. The Arizona Board Association's rules and powers and responsibilities that you are supposed to adhere to indicate that you must, it says shall, coming from a legal background, shall means must, adhere to and carry out the will of the people in the district. That has not been done. It's been proven by both surveys. I encourage you and ask you to follow the will of the people. Your board rules also indicate and ask our students to be creative Excuse thinkers. Yes. You be creative thinkers. You can do this that today is, if you want to. The question is, do you- That is the end of the half, sorry. Returning back to online comments. Kelly Horsa, I'm a pre-K teacher in the district. I returned this year after a little break due to a loss in our family. I'm so happy to be back and cannot wait until it is safe for our pre-K students and all of us to be in the classroom. My concerns are, is it safe for our preschoolers to wear masks all day? This includes our one hour rest time in the middle of the day as well as playground time. No. How can we possibly keep preschoolers six feet apart? It is not developmentally appropriate. It is not okay for their social emotional development. Are we going to be okay? Are we going to be required to provide our online preschool class as well as in person? We are constantly moving and it is inappropriate for all involved. I know our district is working so hard on all of this. Please do not disregard our youngest learners. We want what is best for them and us teachers as well. Thank you. Gabriella Labuda. Thank you for allowing parents to participate in the decision-making process. One, will students be screened for health checks daily, such as checking their temperature and any signs of illness? Will families be asked to please not allow their children to school if any member of the family is displaying signs of illness? Two, will children be allowed to participate in recess and gym without masks on? If this is the case, my concern is that it will be difficult to maintain social distancing in these settings. 
which we all know is the leading cause of transmitting the virus from one host to the next. Certainly, we can be creative in allowing kids to do more isometric exercises that would allow them to be physically active while maintaining social distance. Shannon Lauer, get these kids back in school. There's no reason not to. The data shows it's fine. The state says it's okay. Other schools have returned and done just fine. What's the holdout, PBUSD? Karen Kukulik, I'm a parent of a second grader with an IEP to support literacy and math. She is working hard to learn, but online learning is not a good fit for her. She does well with in-person learning. I'm a teacher back in person teaching to my fourth graders. I've been teaching in person for several years. We wear masks. We space the kids apart as best we can, but do not allow them to interact as they are wearing masks. We wash hands and sanitize at different points throughout the day. They wear masks in PE and at recess. They don't mind. I was nervous at first to go back. I understand being nervous, but it is so worth it. My students are thriving. I am loving my job again because I'm with students. It's different, but we all got used to it quickly. Please be creative. Think about how to get our kids back in person, not ways to not have them in the classroom. There are ways to do it safely. What is Queen Creek doing that we can't? I have not heard of any super spreader issues there. What are some of the charter schools doing that we can't? I haven't heard of any super spreader issues with charters that are open. My school has been open for several weeks with no issues. Please visit schools that are doing this successfully. Come to my school, see my students in person, learning, laughing, having an amazing day, see how they are mask compliant. Interview them to see if they are willing to do things differently in order to be in school. They will all say yes. Come visit my school, talk to the teachers. Some were really, really nervous to be back on campus. Now they are all so happy. Layla McDonald, need to reopen for the mental health of our kids, otherwise losing so many to charter and private. Jenna of Wire, we are the parents of two high school students, a freshman and a junior. <coughs> I am also a nurse who has been working in the hospital throughout the last six months, and we have suffered the death of a family member from COVID-19. <clears throat> we understand and have seen the difficulties and dangers posed by the virus. There's no way to be completely safe. However, my family are doing our part by staying home as much as possible and avoiding all optional social situations. Due to this, the choice for our family is to remain with PB Connect through the remainder of the semester and possibly the rest of the year. However, we have been, become concerned about the board's plan based on the questions in the survey we received from PBHS this morning. It sounds as if the commitment was made for us. Maintaining PB Connect for the entire school year may not remain a choice. There are several other concerns we have which relate to the description of what PB Connect may look like moving forward, with changes to teachers, classes, and electives mentioned in the survey. PB Connect is the baseline now. It has been organized, set up, and functioning with the parameters of each class required curriculum. Lessons are set, methods of teaching and assignment submissions are working, and have been for more than five weeks. Why does it make sense to consider rearranging all of this structure at the time of the expected return to campus, which at its earliest will already be halfway through this semester? Educators had to reinvent the wheel this summer to get online learning set up properly, and now the plan is to again. Annette LaCroix, would like my son to return to school, we are over online school. He gets marked absent, internet goes out, very little motivation to stay engaged with content. Kids need socialization, not isolation. Rachel Volk, please opens school up, kinder through second grade is struggling. Ryan Menenek, please allow our students the option to go back in-person school full-time. Their mental well-being is being negatively affected. Kids need interaction with their peers as well as personal attention that teachers can only effectively give by looking at their students' face in order to know best how to help them. Teachers have that unique gift that most others do not possess. Thank you. Natalie Castaneda. I would love my daughter to be in person as the online studying is not her thing. 
I just ask to consider wisely and carefully the plan to reopen social distancing in my class, like my daughter's class, is small. So now, so how 25 kids will be six feet apart? Thank you for all what you did and do. Anna Kloss. I'm a retired PBUSD teacher with two children attending schools in PBUSD. It is now time to reopen schools. Private schools are open, charter schools are open, many public schools are open. By your own admission, the metrics you have set for reopening are unrealistic. Expecting life to be 100% safe is unrealistic. Expecting students online to learn and meet benchmarks is unrealistic. Expecting parents to continue to tolerate waffling and indecision is unrealistic. The negative consequences from the isolation of this lockdown far outweigh the fractional risk of COVID-19. While over 97% of individuals affected with COVID-19 will recover, our students may not recover from the consequences of not being in school. Rates of domestic abuse, child abuse, depression, and serious mental issues among other children have risen astronomically. Our teachers have worked tirelessly to instruct them remotely. However, there is no way to instruct via Google Meet that equals in-person learning. My students continue to fall behind academically. I know that sending my students back into the classroom may not be 100% safe, but I know for certain that keeping them home any longer is absolutely not good. Open schools now. I will forgive the panic and closures of last spring, but not now. Regardless of the offering differing opinions, excuse me, regardless of the differing opinions of individual board members, parents have clearly indicated we want kids back to school. We are all intelligent. Heather Glazer, please open our schools. Our children need to be in the classroom for their academic, social, and mental health. Your survey results are indicating that the majority of families responding agree. I would support you changing your stance on metrics to align with AZDHS and following the precautions outlined in the 914 study session. My little ones, kinder and second, are counting on you. Please allow us the choice to return to school sooner than later. Those who are not ready to return can continue with PV Connect. It is also time to think outside the box and stop saying we can't and look for alternative ways to say we can. We all understand that in-person school will not look normal for quite some time, and that's okay. Let's utilize outdoor space, avoid about the exposure of special teachers. Can they work from home and stream into the classroom with an aide in the room with the students? You must get creative. Please give families a choice to return to school. It's the right thing and right time to do so. Thank you. Lloyd Aquino, open the schools now. The metrics you are trying to follow is nonsense. Have contingency plan in place. Use numbers from zip code rather than the whole Maricopa County. Leslie Kirk Cohen. For any students that may select the PB Connect model, we do not feel it is in the best interest of the students to be assigned another teacher, and we would not want a teacher from another school. Hopefully it is taken into consideration that it would only be fair for students who remain virtual to have the same opportunity for the same teacher as students who decide to return to classroom learning. It has taken our elementary school students weeks to get acclimated to their teachers, protocols, and technologies, and it is not appropriate to have them start all over with another teacher just because they are choosing a virtual model. Additionally, what are the protocols to be taken when the students go back to classroom learning? Who will ensure they wash their hands and keep their masks on? Will temperatures be taken? What happens if there's a COVID case in the school? Do students who's who choose classroom learning go back to the virtual model if a COVID case should arise? Is there an outdoor option for returning to school since the weather is cooler now? I believe we should continue to follow the initial guidelines that were set for returning to school and only when those guidelines are met, we should return. I realize that many parents would like their students to return to school and I would too, but only when it is safe for students, families, and teachers. Christy Hoover. Please consider a reopening plan for PVUSD for those that want to need their kids to go back into the classroom. The mental and emotional toll that's taken on our kids is significant. If businesses and professional sports can begin, so can schools. As a mother of an ADHD child, it is extremely challenging for him as well as trying to work from home and attend to their needs. 
I understand not everyone is comfortable going back, but for those who are, please consider getting our kids back to some level of normalcy. Thanks. Justin Ciccarello. The children need to be back in school. The social and mental impacts on them are far worse than the virus. Children shouldn't be sitting in front of a, a computer crying because they are frustrated. This is inhibiting their learning. They need to be in class. They need to socialize with their friends. Jit Cobber. We appreciate hard work put in by teachers and students to learn technology and continue effort toward uh, effort forward with an online learning environment. Our request is to continue online education until it is completely safe for teachers and students to return to school. College environments and their increase in classes are worrisome. And it is a good example for us to consider for not opening school at least before the new year. Tara Swartz, none of this is ideal. My concern lies with the consistency of education that my child will get with the reopening and needs for quarantine with all the possible COVID symptoms, which I agree is necessary. As much as I would like to have my kids return in person, it is not better to have consistency with the current mode of education with PB Connect and wait until we reach the initial benchmarks of being in the green for two weeks. There is a reason these benchmarks were set. They are in support of science that minimizes the risk for children to return to school safely. I really hope that you are truly looking at the best interest of the community and our students versus feeling the pressure from other districts. Why let our kids be the guinea pigs when we can watch and wait for a few more weeks to see what other outcomes look like? Valerie Lansdale. My name is Valerie Lansdale, and I have three elementary age kids in the district. I selected PB Connect this summer, but then nine days before school started, I received an email saying that the class my third and fourth grader were in would be virtual for the entire school year. If that wasn't okay with me, they wouldn't be able to take, wouldn't be able to participate in the self-contained gifted program. My other option was to switch schools. It was extremely frustrating to be given such short notice to make this decision. The district has given multiple options for parents that want a virtual learning program, and now it is time to open the option for in-person learning. At the meeting on Monday, it was said that 70% of parents want to go back to the classroom. I believe this is understated because the survey was not sent to the parents that have left the district. Additionally, I have watched all the board meetings since spring break, and I'm concerned that the needs of low-income families in our district are not being met. I believe we have 16 Title I schools in our district. Was the parent survey made available at meal distribution, or were phone calls made to families that have never responded to emails? Doctors, scientists, politicians, parents, basically everyone will have different opinions on when it will be safe for schools to open. Private schools in all the districts around us are opening. It is succumbing to peer pressure. It isn't succumbing to peer pressure to change the metrics in open in person learning. It is listening to the needs of the majority. And Matthew Davis, we should return to in person learning as soon as possible, even though we are in the yellow zone. Michelle? Jeff Woods. As a parent in the PBUSD, I ask that you please allow the parents the choice of in-person versus online school. Online school does not take the place of in-person teach, teacher-led curriculum. We have no concrete plan in place, and a majority of surrounding districts are either back in-person school or have a set time frame for parents. This is unacceptable, and our students are suffering. Please open the schools up and allow parents the choice that works best for them. Cassandra Brown. I would like the social and emotional welfare of high school students to be seen as a high priority for the district. In a time where our governor is warning us about teen suicide increasing, we need to ensure that we are seeing the whole child, not just being reactive to the fact that the teen could get COVID. All of our students have very specific needs and our teens cannot come last. Leah Boyd. As we get closer to meeting the district's criteria for reopening, my concerns regarding the return to in-person learning are mounting. I am a pre-kindergarten teacher and a parent of three in the district. Although I firmly believe in the importance of being in the classroom with my students and my own children with their teachers and peers, I have concerns regarding the readiness to do so safely. 
I asked the board to adhere to the benchmarks that have been put in place and strictly follow the original plan, only returning when the metrics are green for two weeks and then providing teachers and parents adequate transition time. Should the metrics revert back to yellow or red before then, it would be unsafe and irresponsible to rush reopening. Following these measures will allow teachers to mentally and physically prepare for a safe return. In addition, it will give community education time to communicate and prepare pre-K teachers with the exact procedures necessary to follow not only district guidelines, but DHS slash state guidelines as well. Due to these circumstances, one of my assistants needed to resign from her position. Part of returning safely would be to have ample time to hire a new assistant. In addition, it will allow myself to put in place a physical environment that follows new guidelines and is also developmentally appropriate for four to five year olds. This would include being given cleaning supplies necessary to sanitize materials used in the classroom and unfreezing our purchase orders to purchase supplies that would be Leslie Menifee, in-person school. I have a student who is now struggling. He has to do online learning alone as his dad and I work. This is hard on their social life as well. Camber, I don't know if that's IAX or LAX. I want to thank you for your hard work and putting the safety of our students, teachers and staff above, above all the pressure to reopen our schools. We are, not only, we are not the only district that is choosing to stay online right now. One just announced they will stay online for the whole first semester. My son is kinder and his teacher is amazing. He's learning and loving school. Even though he can't wait to go to school and meet friends, he wants to stay online until it can go back to somewhat normal or not be scared he's going back to get sick from COVID. We have lost a family member from COVID-19. I feel that the safety of our kids, teachers, and staff should come before anything else. Lots of parents keep saying I should have a say to if slash when my kids go back to school. What about the teachers and staff? What about the teachers that keep fighting cancer, that have sick loved ones at home that they are taking care of, or that are high risk and that are pregnant, et cetera? How is that fair? I'm asking you to please keep us online until at least the end of the quarter, if not semester. And if we go back at the start of the second quarter, start to go back a couple grade levels at a time. I think by mid-October, we will have a better understanding if a second wave is going to hit. I have heard from a doctor at Phoenix Children's that there could be, there could be, I lost my play, sorry. That there could be worse than just staying online. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, the COVID floors are pretty full and they are positive a second wave is coming. I think staying online instead of going to in-person and having to go back again would be worse. Ozzy Rodriguez, until there's a vaccine, we should not be reopening schools. You really trust kids to maintain social distancing laws many adults can't even follow. Carrie Rivera, we were told when we signed up for PV Connect that it would be available the entire 2020-2021 school year. From the latest email, it seems that may not be the case. Please clarify if one, PV Connect will be available all year, and two, if not, what changed and what can parents do if they do not feel it is safe enough to attend in person? Kara, we want our kids back in school in some capacity. Start with hybrid, anything. Grocery store, restaurant, and retail employees have the choice to either fulfill their job obligation or quit. The teachers committed to returning to in-person when the metrics were met. The numbers are behind. The plan needs to be made and an implementation date needs to be determined. My daughter's grades are slipping. She's not doing well online. She has attention issues and a 504, but no IEP. She desperately needs to go to in-person school. Why is it that pretty much every other school already has a start date or has gone back in some capacity, but Paradise Valley School District has no plan? and has not determined any type of hybrid schedule or phasing in to get kids back to school. We know what to do to minimize the risk, now let's do it. Darcy Manfredi, I wholeheartedly believe the district should continue to adhere to the red, yellow, green metrics. Please do not give in to unsafe demands to ignore the recommendations. Beyond health, me 
health risks, my main concern is the emotional whiplash that may occur if students go back to in-person just to be in dub again. We see this happening all over the country. I would like to know the specific protocols for when someone inevitably tests positive. My questions include, but are not limited to, how will teachers and parents be notified? If a student's family gets sick and that child needs to be quarantined for two weeks, how will they keep up with their schoolwork? When a special teacher gets sick, does the entire school quarantine for two weeks? Do we then revert to PV Connect? What happens if any teacher is exposed and how and has to self-isolate? Who will take over the class? What if a teacher has to do this many times a semester? Will their students also have to quarantine? How will they keep up with the schoolwork if they are compelled to stay home for weeks at a time with little to no advance notice? What happens when there is a massive subs shortage? Will classes be combined into even larger groups? Will subs exposed be tracked as they move from school to school? If the school decides that a classroom is still safe after a documented COVID exposure, but the parents are no longer comfortable, what are the options? I realize this is an impossible situation and I appreciate the board's work. Please continue to err on the side of safety. Thank you. <clears throat> And this is from Gargle. Please open our schools. Our kids need to be back. William Hook. Remote schooling has been a disaster. Our child is five and she did not benefit at all from virtual schooling as she is not old enough for this type of schooling, even with the proper assistance, which cannot be given by parents who work full time during the week. Most parents are not trained educators. To expect us to be teachers on top of our other duties is ludicrous. Our taxpayer agreement has been breached without a remedy and we were left with no option but to go with the expensive option of sending our children to private school until in-person school resumes. We are very disappointed. Excuse me. Genevieve Haas. I am writing in support following the metrics and science when it is safe to open our schools like you are currently doing. The biggest risk to opening too early is to our teachers and administrators, and this, in my opinion, is too much to ask. Of course, my kids would like to be back at school, but I don't believe it is worth risking someone's life. Their schools and teachers, in partnership with the district, have done a very good job administering curriculum in the online format, and I am fine continuing that until the teachers and administrators deem schools safe to open. Thank you for allowing us to speak on the issue. Jim Guyman, I am a pediatric dentist and practice, and my practice is located within the district boundaries. I see 35 to 40 patients, children, per day along with their parents. For the past month, I've been asking school-aged children and their parents if they like virtual school from home. 80 to 90% have said they want to go back. Many parents complain of difficulties with learning and working. When prompted, all have mentioned appreciation for the teacher's efforts to make the best of a difficult situation. Parents and students want to go back. These children are bright. They can see that other parts of our society are going back to in-person, many of which only benefit adults. We send a message to them about how much our society values them and their educational experience by prioritizing a return to other less meaningful things. Let's send, send them a better message and get back to school. Is it safe? It can be done so safely. Dentistry is one of the highest risk settings as we regularly aerosolize the saliva of our patients. However, we have followed standard precautions since May 1st in Arizona with no cluster outbreaks. Schools can follow recommended precautions and be safe as well. By going back, some sickness will occur, as they always have, but we, as families and a district, can minimize that for teachers and students and be safe. Mary Ness. My daughter is 14 years old and the only child living at home. She already struggles with anxiety and depression. She has basically been alone in her room since March. She is not eating or sleeping properly, and although she has started her first year of high school with a positive attitude and was trying really hard she is now starting to fall behind and fail due to internet interruptions and not being able to get back in the virtual classroom. I am extremely concerned for her mental health way more than for getting COVID. 
if the teachers don't want to be in the classroom with these kids, then with these kids, then perhaps we should find someone else who does. Perhaps have the teachers work from home and have the kids be in the classroom with security cameras and have supervisors monitoring them from the hall. I just think someone needs to start thinking outside the box on this problem. These kids are suffering. Debbie Donison, I thank you for your efforts. Margaret Uchia, could we begin school in person again after the first quarter ends? It just seems to be the most ideal time as we end the first learning period and start the second one. Thank you for considering this request. Terry Sheldon, PBUSD is prematurely allowing in-person learning the school causing unnecessary potential for COVID exposure to the students and allowing opportunity for possible litigation from parents, students, staff. Tina Lee, online learning is not beneficial long-term for my children, causing increasing frustrations, not learning, emotional damage due to social isolation and increased stress for all family members. We need to protect our children and teachers with masks and PPE and return to school. Michelle Gabbard, our family fully supports the board's decision to use safe be benchmarks for return to school. We realize the board is under tremendous pressure from families that simply do not see the risks involved with going back to in-person instruction. But I feel the majority do not support these often radical viewpoints. Please do not give in to their radical attempts, i.e. protests, rallies, petitions to recall the board, etc., to forego safety in our schools. As a physician who is often called upon to make leadership decisions in our community, I want our board to know that I fully support your strategies for returning back to school and that having these excellent distance learning opportunities is effective. We would like to continue to have PV Connect offered in 2021 for the upper grades as well, excuse me, as, as we still have a limited scientific data to risk going back to in-person teaching at this time. Sending my freshman to, into class with 900 kids in her grade would appear reckless at this time. We implore you to make the best decision for our children and their teachers. We look forward to working with the PV board as we all make challenging decisions for our children. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, we have hit, ooh. Was that for me? Um, we hit 90 minutes, which was the time we allotted. I want to thank both Dr. Corson and, and Ms. Anderson for um, all of the comments um, and, and sticking through with them. Um, we are going to take a short break. Is if, Yeah, I can see the board members. Um, five minutes enough? Or, okay quick five minute break. We will be back at 1145. Thank you, President Greenberg. And uh, wait for the presentation to pop up here, hopefully in a second. Work on all our technology. So while that's coming up, um, what I'd like to share here today um, is based on, there we go. Um, let's see, make sure it's coming up on everybody's monitors here. I have it online, but I don't see it on the monitors here. There we go. You're the queen of the buttons. I appreciate that. All right. So, um, you know, based on our feedback from Monday's governing board study session and informed by uh, input from some of our medical experts, I'd like to share a brief presentation and recommendation for an amendment to our existing reopening criteria. So, as you recall, we adopted our current reopening criteria on August 6th based on the work of SCORE, input from medical experts, and guidance pr provided by the Arizona Department of Health Services. We established criteria for a return to in-person learning in alignment with the guidance of AZ, uh, AZDHS at 10 cases per 100,000 population and testing positivity below 5%. 
Our criteria for a return to online learning differed from AZDHS with a uh, return trigger at 50 cases per 100,000 population. Uh, shown here is the data for the last seven weeks for cases per 100,000 persons. Coming down from highs statewide in early July, we have seen a steady decline in overall cases over this period of time, with cases flattening out for the last three, three weeks right around 30 per 100,000 persons. As shared during our study session on Monday, the data suggests that while adapt, adopting one, 10 cases per 100,000 made sense at the time, with community spread ongoing, it seems unlikely we will reach 10 cases per 100,000 in the foreseeable future and that we may have hit a natural floor. And then uh, similarly shown here is the data for the last six weeks for percent positivity. And you can see that overall there's a downward trend and we are currently at 3.62%. As was shared by our medical experts, a low percent positivity rate indicates that there is both a sufficient level of testing available to characterize and identify any outbreaks and that overall community spread remains relatively low. Uh, as you recall, we've been in uh, consultation with a number of health experts, including Dr. Heather Ross, Dr. Rebecca Sunshine, Dr. Kristen Lau, um, who actually is available if we need her today, um, and our lead nurses uh, and others in our community to gather input regarding health criteria. Based on that feedback, as was shared Monday, uh, it's likely that that current level of cases per 100,000 persons may not get much lower than our current levels. It was also shared that setting a target that is too low may limit the ability to reopen and stay open. One suggestion that was provided by uh, some of our medical experts was that based on our current data and science, we could set that target at 50 per 100,000. And so based on the feedback from Monday's governing board study session and informed by our medical experts for your consideration and potential approval is a recommendation to amend our reopening criteria to the following. In order for PV schools to return to in-person learning, the following criteria would need to be met, and that is below 50 cases per 100,000 persons and below 5% testing positivity. Conversely, in order for PV schools to return to a distance learning model for all students, the following criteria would need to be met, and that would be above 100 cases per 100,000 persons or above 10% testing positivity. In either case, the target would need to be met for two weeks before a change in learning modality would occur. These targets would continue to be measured via the district level data available on the Maricopa County Department of Public Health dashboard, which is updated every Thursday at 9 a.m. I would point out that the proposed criteria for in-person learning has already been met for the last three, or three weeks in a row and would allow us to begin implement, to implement plans for that return to in-person learning based upon a timeline that we can share in the next agenda item. I appreciate your consideration and the staff and I are available to answer any further questions. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. Um, Mr. had asked if she could also address this um, agenda item and I know that she's on the schedule. So if you wanna go ahead and do that. Hearing the amendments the, that is being proposed for the board to approve I would support those um, if those are met, if they allow for an in-person return by the first day of the start of second quarter, which is directly after um, in October. My question though, is we continue to hear, you've spoken with medical professionals. Those medical professionals are, you listed a few of them, but I know a few of them are, and not all of them are listed. If they are, if you're obtaining information from both sides of the issue so that you have a fair balanced approach in this in the considerations you need to make. Others in the community is very vague term you throw out. Again, are they balanced? Are they being considered balanced? Um, if we do meet these metrics, I would encourage the board that you do not any longer need that two week transition period. It should these all these items that you listed as to why you needed the two week transition period thereafter, after we met the metrics was could have been done and should have been done simultaneously since March when we shut down. I don't know what the board's been doing since March to lay out parameters to develop safety protocols to for teachers and staff to arrange child care. That was one of the reasons given why we need the two week protocol or two week transition. 
And the last reason given was so that um, lesson plans could be adjusted. That can be done simultaneously. It does not need to be done at, and as an extra time period to delay the return. Thank you. Great timing, thank you. Um, throwing it open to the board. Anybody have any comments? Ms. Matura? Um, so I just want to make a comment about the using the uh, 50 per 100,000 versus the 10 per 100,000. And a, a reason I'm comfortable looking at this number versus like the percent positivity, I feel like from the beginning, the reason that, uh, that I was looking at that combination of numbers was it allowed us almost a, a safety valve that in case the percent, the percent positivity were coming down, but for some reason those numbers were going up, we could acknowledge that and take that into an account. Into an account. But as we're seeing them both kind of trend together right now, that allow, it allows us to see where we are naturally and nothing is going on in opposite directions. So I appreciate having that, the ability, I look at it more as a, a number that would be really helpful for when we see, when we hit red again, um, and so I appreciate that we have that uh, in place so that it is that safety stop for when and if we need to return to online. Um, I just have a couple of questions about the hybrid model. So we're, we're under the assumption that we're going to achieve a hybrid model because some families will not will choose not to have their students back in class. However, when we look at the survey numbers, which I'm not sure are accurate because I think parents answered that thinking they were answering on our prior metrics. So I think we're gonna to need to figure out how many actually wanna come back given if this passes, given the metrics that we um, have revamped. But what is, what is a hybrid look like in a school where 90% of students are coming back into the classroom. I mean, what is the definition of hybrid from the Maricopa County of Department of Health? That's my question. Yeah, um, Member Bacon, I'll be glad to answer that. Yeah, there, so to the question of definition of hybrid, the um, and it really is coming from I think the state, both the Department of Education and you know the state health agencies. It is I think as we alluded to at the last meeting, very loose. It is really only defined as some students learning in person and some students learning online. Um, I think that's also um, part of why, and, and you know, honestly, I feel like it would be a little disingenuous to say it's a hybrid model. I mean, that's why we're specifically not saying that, you know, we're meeting criteria for hybrid. I know there was some discussion on that at our last meeting. Um, but yeah, to say that you have, and again, it's, I think it, you're exactly right. It is going to vary a little bit, um, the survey data, which I know we're going to get to in the next item too, but uh, is going to vary a little bit just depending upon, you know, what things get decided today that may change the thinking of some parents in terms of what they've responded. Um, but, um, you know, when we're looking at the data currently where it's at and about two thirds of families perhaps expressed an interest in a return to in-person and about one third, at least from those who responded, um, suggested that they would like to remain in that PV Connect model. I think that's, you know, again, what might change and, um, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, again, depending upon how one wants to think of a hybrid, I, in my mind, I don't think that's really what, um, from an educational perspective is intended in terms of a hybrid model. And that's why specifically, you know, we're not saying that this is a hybrid model. Cause again, I, I think personally that's a little disingenuous. Okay. And then my follow-up question is it classroom by classroom, will we, will we be able to tell students to tell parents how many students will be in that classroom? so that they can make a decision based on the numbers of students in the classroom. So to inform their decision, if we can do that and parents, um, and we also note that we're not calling this hybrid, we're meeting, we're not meeting the recommendations of what we would consider a hybrid classroom. Um, I could live with this but we have got to be very specific with our families that this is not going to look like what you're imagining. There will be maybe 28 kids in the classroom 
who will not be social distanced at all. So that's my concern is that we inform parents, tell them exactly what it's going to look like, and then let them make a decision. We can't, we can't go on what we have right now if we revamp these criteria. Um, I guess, okay, thank you. Um, I, along with what Julie, uh, Mrs. Bacon said, um, I think we do need another survey and we're gonna have to work harder to get better returns, especially from some of the, some of the Title I schools. I, I noticed some patterns there and we'll need to give some, you have this many hours to respond or you have 24 hours or whatever. I mean, there has to be some and, and push from the teachers from online education that you need to get your survey in because we can't set up classes unless we know who's going to return. So there has to be a really big push. And in looking at the numbers, some schools had a much higher return than others. We have to figure out what they did and then have it replicated at other schools. So I had mentioned to you before, what are we doing to have the schools return uh, their surveys? So I, as Mrs. Bacon said, we need to say, these are the metrics we're using. This is what classrooms will look like. And they need to be fully informed that when they vote, that this is what it's gonna be. And, and uh, uh, but in very short, concise words, because no one will read it if it's too long. So maybe bullet points or whatever, so you don't have to use as many words. But um, uh, we will need another survey in the next very few days to know what we're going to be doing. Yeah, and let, and let me clarify on that too with the survey, because you're exactly right. And again, I don't think it's anything that um, perhaps we may not have anticipated. It's, you know, there are obviously some communities where it's a lot harder to get that those responses from parents. And I know in many of those cases, while the survey itself closed Wednesday afternoon, schools are still working to connect with those families that did not respond. I don't know that sending a second survey and saying, well, we really mean it this time is going to maybe get different answers. I and mean, we will work with the schools in terms of the best way to make sure that we're getting that input from families, which I think is really the critical piece. Um, you know, but in some cases it may be, you know, literally having to make phone calls to be able to connect with those families and make sure that we know what choice that family is opting for and that they understand what that means. Um, I think that may be actually where, where we end up having to go with that, again, with some communications coming from the school level. But somehow our new metrics have to be informed along with that. And, and that is just what we need to be doing. So nothing is hidden. Everything is out, out there. And so they know. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually think we need to um, not, this is not call it a survey. We're not surveying. I mean, even though we're going to see some percentages we're asking parents whether they want to return their students to in-person learning or keep them in PD Connect. That, were, that was the question. It wasn't a, we're taking the pulse of the community. We are, we were lit correct. We were literally asking, were their students gonna come back? I mean, a survey is when you're getting opinion. This was actual, we were trying to get base level data and if we are going to go back, even if it's on a class by class basis, as Mrs. Bacon was just suggesting, again, it's not a survey. It is a, we would like to know if your student's returning. So I, I, you know, I just, I think we have surveyed. We certainly have surveyed in the past. I didn't view this last questionnaire as a survey. I viewed it as a, here, are you returning to class or not? So I think just, so then it's what important. would you suggest it being called? It's a, it's a questionnaire. Okay. It's a, whatever you want to call I mean, it. It's, it just needs a to survey, be done and a get survey, results. Just semantically and, and by definition, the survey tends to 
it's like we want your opinion and this was not an opinion based question or set of questions. Um, if nobody else on the board has anything for the moment, I would like us to consider some different metrics um, for criteria for returning to distance learning for all students. Um, you know, we are currently, the recommendation has changed for, for, re, for, turn, for going to in-person learning, essentially, you know, multiplying the, the base level, shall we say, by quite a bit, but we haven't done anything to really look at the upper level. Um, I believe, you know, most medical professionals will tell you that when the pandemic hit and as cases um, started expanding, they expanded exponentially. So it wasn't just a two plus two, it was two times two, times two, times et cetera. And they expanded very quickly. Um, you know, I know there is some discussion that we could be looking at a second wave. And if we do, it will come very quickly. And I think we need to be very cognizant that if we are suddenly, you know, if we maintain this sort of 30 case per 100,000 level for quite some time, we have our testing positivity below five, and then all of a sudden we see it start spiking. I think it's irresponsible not to look at that and be prepared to close further or close quickly. Um, so I would appreciate if we could consider some different criteria that really allows us to do that. Maybe that if we hit, you know, 85 cases per 100,000, um, that we be prepared. That if the next week, rather than we wait two weeks at 100, that if the next week has hit 95 or 100, we shut it down. I can't imagine that if we're at 95, suddenly we're dropping back down to 60 or something. Um, I'm also a little concerned that on the previous slide, it said um, feedback from medical professionals was that above 7% is too high for beginning fully in-person learning. We've acknowledged that that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about a hybrid model. And yet our criteria for distance learning would be testing positivity above 10%. And so I think I would ask that we perhaps reconsider that 10%, that we look maybe at an 8%. So it's a little bit higher than the 7%, but maintain the or. I mean, if, if numbers start going up, they're going up. I, I, you know, based on what we've been dealing with, I, I think we have to be very cognizant of that. So I would ask, if, you know, the board would consider that. Susan. So I have a concern with changing that because the wording here is that above 7% they felt was too high for beginning in person. And I feel like the way that the county built their numbers was that the reason they set 7% in the middle of their yellow um, metric was that it wasn't just as soon as you dipped into yellow, go ahead and start um, getting ready, that you actually had to keep going down into the yellow, but it still was the yellow zone. So I think there's a difference between beginning something or using that as the top point. And so using the 10% does keep us in line with the county data um, as the top of the yellow mark. So I, um, so I understood that to be they wouldn't want to start hybrid, but that it's still considered yellow between the five and the 10. And that's why they picked the seven for their version, for their, what they were calling hybrid. Um, and so I think it makes more sense to leave it with the county, the county yellow zone. Even though that we're acknowledging that we're not in a hybrid model. Yes, because they, and, for them below 5% was appropriate. So if you're just looking at percentages and you're not, I know we're mixing the two numbers, but below 5% was appropriate um, for the in-person. I know it was in conjunction with the double green, um, but if you're just looking at the percent positivity, the 5%, which we are below. So we weren't starting, the idea is not starting as you're heading down 
or starting as you're heading up. Um, and so I, I feel that we are, we're well below the 7% right now. Um, so, so I, I don't have a problem leaving it at the 10%. I'm sorry. I didn't hear your last comment. I don't have a problem leaving it at the 10%. Okay. What about the cases per hundred thousand? Right. And moving that in line, the hundred moves that in line with the county data as well. If, if I may to president Greenberg, you know, one based on what you were just sharing too, one possible suggestion for amendment two is, you know, if with that upper trigger, if we wanted to say that um, with that upper trigger, if we met that even for one week that we would then um, move back to a distance learning model, I think that would be, I think a way to accommodate what you're, what you're suggesting there. So, I mean, obviously we are continuing to monitor that data on a weekly basis. If we start to see we're moving toward that point, I think we could obviously give our families an alert letting them know that we're seeing a pattern towards that. And then when we got to that point, that would trigger it at that point. I think that's just an option. I could go with that option that we do one way if it, the minute it hits. And what did you say? I could go with that option that we don't wait two weeks. If we hit one of these metrics, we're going to go down because it's not like we're going to be at 36 cases and the next week we're going to be at a hundred we're going to know it's it's heading there right i and i believe it's easier to shut down than it is to start and so i don't think we need the lead time and everything i mean we we, we will have had the chromebooks the communication the a lot of different things so i think we'll be watching the metrics very carefully and we will completely be encouraging our community, help us, please. We want to keep kids in school. Do your part. I mean, to me, that is the message that we have to constantly be sending. Is this an appropriate time for me to perhaps make a comment? Oh, Mrs. Matura. Hang on. I, I think that was Dr. Lyle. Hold on. Yes, that was me, Dr. Lau. I just wanted to I just wanted to point out to the board members that I think we need to be very, or you be very careful in how you are uh, potentially mixing the data and sort of creating your own set of metrics. And I think for transparency purposes and fairness to parents and teachers with whatever decision you guys make today, I think it would be critical to include in any future surveys or questionnaires or decision-making tools or what have you um, to make it clear to parents that if you're adopting your own set of metrics for return to school or closures or what have you, um, that it is not currently in line with Maricopa County Department of Public Health and the Arizona uh, Department of Health Services so that people know that because I think a lot of parents and community members um, would assume that a leadership board is um, following them in a certain direction. And so I think um, it would just be really important to include some of that data. And I will point out that Currently, Maricopa County Department of Public Health and the Arizona Department of Health Services have set forth these guidelines, um, these colors, if you will, about low risk, moderate risk, and high risk, and how they relate to what scenarios are safe based on a lot of data. These numbers were not come up with totally arbitrarily. And currently, their recommendation, as you know, is for a hybrid model of learning is appropriate for um, the Paradise Valley School District. And so while initially the district um, adopted maybe a more cautious approach, um, requiring that we're sort of in the green, if you will, to return to school, science would support through Maricopa County Department of Public Health and the AZDHS would currently support returning some kids to school based on the metrics where we are right now, but only in a hybrid model. And as Dr. Welsh said, um, if you don't feel that this could truly be looked at as offering a hybrid model and that what we are really doing 
is opening our district to traditional learning. The uh, county health department and the Arizona State Department have both agreed that it is not yet safe to offer a traditional learning model for schools until we meet both green metrics. So I just want to make it clear that I think the board should be very transparent with parents and the community about what you're doing um, as you go forward. Thank you, Dr. Long. So does anybody else have any comments, questions? President Greenberg. Yes, um, so true. I, I just wanted to say I agree using the one week to trigger the change as we're going up because we do have that entire time that we're watching that we will be um, alerting the public and begging the public to please help us with our metrics. Um, but I, I do think at taking it to that one week, uh, I agree with that, that option to change that there. Um, I have a comment and this, I'm not trying to be rude in my comment. I just want to say for those parents who have been requesting for some time, if we're going to be quick to close down, we should be quick, quick to open. And, and the metrics you have said we have met with our new criteria. And so I have some difficulties with pushing off that. So we're talking about how quick we can close. I want to state that we need to be talking about how quick we can open as a converse. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other comments or are we, can we have a motion please, Dr. Skidmore? So move to accept to the new amended reopening criteria, noting the criteria um, under recommendations for reopening criteria, criteria must be met for one week to train, one week to trigger change in learning modality. Mrs. Matura? I have a clear question. Um, are we looking at the one week in both directions or the one week for closing and two weeks for opening? Uh, for hitting those metrics. I apologize. Uh, I'll weigh in just on that. Uh, as I heard it, I think the concern was more in the direction of moving upward than downward. So if, if that's the case and that's the will of the board, I think we could word it in that way that it's specifically that one week for moving up in particular. I mean, yeah, I think what we're saying is this is to trigger um, the return to distance learning. So I believe that we should. Great. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear yeah. in the motion. Thank you. Yes. So does everybody agree, understand that this, um, the criteria must be met for one week to trigger a return to distance learning? Okay. Um, so are we ready to vote? Can we do this by roll call vote, please? Dr. Skidmore? Aye. Mrs. Matura? Aye. Mrs. Greenberg? Um, I'd like to read something. Um, not that many years ago, this board, except for Susan, because she had not yet been elected, approved the expenditure of a large amount of funds to enhance safety measures in our schools and facilities, actions that were widely supported by the community. Throughout our campuses, we added more security cameras. We rebuilt and reconfigured entrances and exits. We added or improved fencing and other structures. We had bulletproof partitions installed. We changed protocols and more. And all of this was done to ensure the increased safety and security for our students and staff. The safety of our students and staff has always been a priority in Paradise Valley. It has remained so in terms of how we've had to deal with COVID-19 and how we are able to deliver instruction. As executive orders have been issued, we've had to incorporate the proclamations and requirements into our operations and processes. 
Throughout it all, our amazing staff has worked tirelessly to support our students, our families, our communities, and each other. We closed in March, as did every other district because of an executive order. We reopened in August online, as did the vast majority of districts in the state due to a different executive order. This was after several weeks in which the number of cases of COVID in Arizona had reached alarming levels, and the State Department of Health Services was tasked via that latter executive order with creating benchmarks for districts to safely reopen in person. The State Department issued its guidance on the same day we in Paradise Valley adopted our benchmarks for return, and the thresholds for green were what ADHS had recommended. Some have now asked whether we adopted them to keep our schools closed. No, we adopted them with the full expectation that we could achieve them and be able to completely reopen for in-person learning for all of our students safely and without restrictions and without many of the mitigation strategies that we are going to have to put in place. The data for our district available now from the Maricopa County Department of Public Health does not show us in green, a level that some districts and cities in Maricopa County have been able to attain. It does show, however, for the past three weeks, some stability at a level that public health officials now may feel may be at the lower end of what may be, we may realistically achieve for some time. So the question is, is whether that is sufficient to amend our criteria to begin in-person learning with numerous mitigation strategies in place for a PV prepared plan, specially created protocols, and standard operating procedures. I fervently want students back in the classroom, as I do, as I believe our educators do, as I believe everybody on the board, everybody in this room does. But the data shows we are at a moderate, not minimal risk level. And that means we have to mitigate the risk to reduce it. If we follow our plan with absolute fidelity throughout the district, I do believe we have the opportunity and the ability to do just that. But only if every individual in school truly follows the requirements and restrictions in place. We have a mass mandate that is now part of our parent student handbook. Masks are not optional. And just this week, the head of the CDC reiterated that wearing a mask may be the most powerful mitigation strategy each of us can do. However, if a family decides that their student will not wear a mask, the student, excuse me, must remain in distance learning. If a family intentionally, or excuse me, if a student intentionally disregards the mask mandate on campus, the student will need to return to distance learning. This is not a suggestion. It's an absolute, and every staff member should have the authority to ensure it is followed. There are also hand washing and physical distancing protocols and much more. Again, these are not suggestions. They are requirements. There are many, many changes that have to be incorporated into our classroom and schools because of COVID. And some of them are there because there is one strategy we likely will not be able to use in most classrooms, and that is recommended levels of physical distancing. Our schools were never built for minimal numbers of students in classrooms, nor has our funding allowed for it. And this is one of the greatest concerns I have about re-entry into our classrooms at this time. And it's why I have continuously stressed the need to ensure not just that all the other strategies receive absolute adherence, but that we as a district uphold our commitment to these strategies and to supplying our teachers and staff with everything they need to keep their classrooms safe. Someday research is gonna give us a vaccine. Someday we're gonna see treatments and we will be able to fully return to schools, the settings, the school settings we left but we are not there and we won't be there for a while. I had a couple other things I wanted to say, but I realize I'm going on. I believe we can do this. I wanna see schools back in classrooms, but I really can only support it if I know everyone on our campuses will adhere to protocols and will realize that unfortunately there are consequences if they don't. I vote to support this motion at this time, but I also, as a am asking that as a board, we continue to receive very detailed information regarding adherence to protocols once we open, regarding status of supplies, reports of potential cases or positive tests on campuses, and any other information we require. I believe that if we find that our case and positivity numbers are rising, 
and that rise correlates to reopening or if we find that there are other issues that we have to deal with based on all of the things we need that may require action by the board. I believe we will need to be calling as many special sessions as needed to resolve any issues as quickly as possible. But for the moment, I vote aye. Mrs. Case? <clears throat> I'd like to preface my vote. Um, I've literally read hundreds and hundreds of emails from parents, from teachers, even from students. I've talked to many, many people. Um, this is difficult. None of us have ever been through a pandemic. And um, I think we have to be looking at the whole child, not just their educational, but we also have to be looking at the social, emotional, and mental state of our students. And we have to be so concerned with the um, cleaning procedures and mask wearing. We have to do all of those things. And I, 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 I vote yes for this. And I just want to say that <clears throat> these are difficult times. And I'm not voting yes to not listen to the many teachers who've shown concern. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Mrs. Bacon. Thank you. I have a, I have a few comments to make before I vote. Um, I have significant concerns uh, about the health and safety of our students and staff if we go back at this point in time. To have a child or staff member seriously ill or God forbid die as a result, result of exposure uh, is not something that is gonna be easy to live with. Um, I know parents want to make the decision for their own families and they absolutely should do that. My job is to make the decision for 29,000 students um, and it's much harder to do on that scale. I think the beauty of our country is our ability to incorporate different views and decisions that we make. And having an outlier like me in a governing body, it's not bad. It's what this country was built on. And I appreciate everyone who shared their perspectives, both positive and negative. Many letters uh, that we've received have been critical of the board and in particular me, and that's fair. I've been called inflexible, rigid, negative, and many other very delightful terms. The whole board has been threatened with recall and, and not, not being voted for in the next election. And to those things, I say good. I don't wanna be on this board if the voters in Paradise Valley don't want me on it. Please know that I don't see that as a threat. I see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to get more people involved and fired up about public education. Those people who feel that they are against me will know, will be, probably be surprised to know that I consider them an ally, an ally in the fight for public education. I was you once. I was very unhappy with the board, that, an issue the board was, discovered, was considering, and that's how I ended up in this seat. I was the squeaky wheel and the parent who wasn't happy. And that's where my inner activist was ignited. I've been advocating for public schools for decades and I'm happy to see a lot of new advocates in our community. Please join us in the fight for the things that you say your children need. Don't leave us when this is over. Stick with us. Help us make policy makers understand the importance of social emotional supports in schools and wraparound services for all our students. Recognize that the students that you're talking about who are living in very difficult home situations will continue to live in those situations when school's back in session. And we do not have the kind of services that we need in this state to provide what schools are expected to do. So don't leave us, stick with us. Tell everyone you know how important your school community is and how hard it was when we were closed. Ask your friends and neighbors to recognize the contributions of our employees. And most importantly, help us spread the word that your children are bright, capable, ambitious, talented, and worthy of the support of every member of the community. Be our partner, be, be there for both your child and every other student in our district. So, Given that I believe we are making up 
our own metrics that, and we cannot adhere to the metrics provided by both the Maricopa County Health Department and the Maricopa, or in the Arizona Department of Public Health. Given the very limited budgets and space we have in our schools, I am not able to vote in favor of these new metrics. So I beg nay. Thank you. The motion passes 4 1. Next on the agenda is, I'm not sure I say it right, consideration approval of the recommendation of a reopening staggered start plan. Dr. Rush. Thank you once again, President Greenberg. And while we're uh, getting the technology up, uh, again, this is very, very similar uh, based on the feedback from Monday's governing board study session and informed by input from our principals and from PVEA. I would like to share a brief presentation and recommendation for a staggered start plan for reopening. Um, so as was alluded to a, a few times earlier, uh, and as we had shared Monday, each school sent out a survey to families last Friday, which closed uh, Wednesday afternoon. And while schools are still working to reach families that did not yet provide a response, um, you can see that overall families of about two thirds of students have indicated they are planning to return in person at this time. And uh, I think we talked about this earlier as well, that depending upon the actions taken at today's meeting, those responses may shift. And we know that additional outreach is gonna to need to be done with families to confirm those choices. And that's going to be something that schools are gonna need time to, in order to complete. So we can make sure that everyone is comfortable with the choices that they're making. As was also shared on Monday, things will look different for students returning in person, and we will have significant mitigation protocols and procedures in place. And while there is obviously a lot on this uh, slide, I think the foremost uh, thing for everyone to keep in mind is that all students and staff will be required to wear cloth face masks. And I want to reiterate that we remain 100% committed to ensuring that staff and students are masked up. Um, we will have additional cleaning and sanitizing in place. We will have installed additional hand washing stations, hand sanitizer stations, and water bottle filling stations. And I know, again, we've discussed all these uh, in detail Monday, and we'll be providing families with additional information as we talked about as we approach in-person learning. So uh, as was also shared Monday and based on um, some feedback provided, some of the rationale that we considered in developing our plans for a staggered start include, um, first, uh, just allowing our students most in need of returning to in-person learning to come back earliest, uh, allowing our reopening to be spread out over time to ensure stability in those health benchmarks. Um, it allows us to test out systems and routines with a smaller number of students and um, and this was something that was um, some specific feedback um, really from, I think, both the board and, some, and our principals, um, providing students in those transition grades, so kindergarten, seventh grade, and ninth grade specifically, the opportunity to acclimate to the campus since they've likely not had the opportunity to set foot on the campus, maybe just to pick up items um, since the pandemic. And so uh, the recommendations that we will be providing regarding a staggered start incorporate that feedback again from cabinet principals and PVEA. Some of the consideration regarding the timing that we want to be sensitive about included, one, we reviewed key dates on our school calendar and how they impact plans to return. Uh, I wanna remind uh, everyone that our principals and teachers are off contract September 28th through 30th, that is a fall break. And we know that many families may have travel plans on fall break. Uh, we also wanted to be sensitive to making substantial changes right before the start of the second quarter and the impact that that might have on students' grades and teacher workload in grading assignments. As noted earlier in this presentation, schools are still working to reach families that did not pry to response. And depending upon the actions taken at today's meeting, we know that those responses may shift. Um, that additional outreach uh, will need to be done with families to confirm their choices which we recognize will take time for schools to complete. Principals and teachers also expressed support for following through on the commitment we had made to provide a two week transition time to finalize scheduling, determine which students were participating in person or through PV Connect, update lesson planning for a mix of in-person and PV Connect, participate in professional development, 
receive training regarding implementing health and safety protocols and procedures at the site, and to arrange adjustments to childcare based upon return dates. So based on the input from Monday's governing board study session and informed by input from our principals and PVEA for your consideration and potential approval is a recommendation for a staggered start plan for reopening. So as you can see on the slide, we would be recommending a start on October 8th, that is a Thursday. And, uh, and again, I'll kind of run through the thinking on some of that in just a moment for our pre-K, grades K through three, grades seven and nine, and then Roadrunner Sweetwater and our uh, self-contained special education programs. On Monday, October 12th, grades four through six, eight and 10 would return. And then finally, on Monday, October 19th, grades 11 and 12 would return. And these recommendations incorporate the tenants I shared in the previous slide, as well as accomplish uh, a few key objectives. Uh, again, um, in particular, our secondary principals expressed support for having students in those transition grades, grades seven and nine, return earlier. And they felt that they only needed a couple of days with them individually before allowing other students to return. Starting that first cohort of students on the 8th maintains the commitment we had to two weeks transition time as was promised to staff and families. Uh, again, a reminder, of course, we have that fall break in there from the 28th to 30th. Um, opening over three weeks, uh, we believe meets that philosophy as discussed last time of not uh, opening the barn doors and staggering that opening. And the delivery dates for additional technology for the combined in-person PV Connect model is scheduled to arrive within alignment with this time frame. We also want to share that all staff would be able to participate in those three days that we've been talking about for professional development training room setup um, on October 5th through 7th. So that week of the 5th through 7th, all those teachers would be able to participate that, in that and then um, you know, students would begin to return on uh, the 8th. And those days would be primarily online independent learning days for all students. The other piece uh, to consider in this is we'll be able to manage the need to continue to provide on-site support, um, which is still remains a requirement of Executive Order 2020-51. And it also uh, aligns with, uh, just for what it's worth, uh, the timing of reopening in several other districts. It's within one week of all districts returning in some of our neighboring districts, including Deer Valley, Medicine Elementary, and Scottsdale, and is actually ahead of um, some of our neighboring districts who, contrary to what you might have heard, not everybody has actually announced return dates, but uh, Glendale Union High School and Washington Elementary, which at this point in time have not uh, announced return dates. So with all uh, that in mind, uh, I thank you for your consideration. And of course, staff and I are available to answer any further questions. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. I have a comment card. Uh, Susie C. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Welsh, President Greenberg and Governing Board. Thank you for the opportunity to address the agenda item today regarding your staggered reopening plan. Many teachers support this idea. It will allow schools to test their plan protocols with fewer students on some sites. But I do need to remind you that some of our school, one of our schools is already fully operational. That's Roadrunner. And two more will be filled to capacity, Palomino and Echo Primary Schools on the very first date. I've asked that the district consider adding two more asynchronous days to the start of the pre-K-3 schedule for pre PV Connect students and one day for students grade four, six. There are important reasons for this, not the least of which is that the first two days of pre-K-3 instruction will be focused on norms and expectations the kids sitting at home don't need to spend six and a half hours online suffering through practicing lining up at the door, measuring our social distance spaces, and learning the new pathways through the school to specials, lunch, and the playground. Additionally, I would ask you to consider how incredibly difficult virtual teaching is and imagine our teachers managing it all on the first two days. These kids have been learning from home a long time time. They're going to need a couple of days to settle down, and the families that have chosen to stay on PV Connect will understand. They have selected that option for important personal reasons, and I have no doubt they recognize the importance of teaching our youngest and often most physically fragile students, the self-contained students, how to stay safe in this new PV-prepared world. 
I thought I got three minutes. Yeah. Finally, I would ask that you support support us in strictly maintaining the protocols that have been established in multiple committees since March. The PV prepared document was created with the combined efforts of parents, teachers, administrators, and members of the local medical community. Many of us worry that the deference shown to small numbers of vocal parents will soon translate into negotiations about masks, the size of indoor gatherings allowed, and performances. This document was created with a focus on nationwide and even global scientific guidance and is designed to guide our thinking all year long or longer, not until we get tired of the practices or can say we can no longer bear to say no to our deep desire to hear our children sing or cheer while they play. In other words, in answer to the many letters, comments, and social media posts I've seen, there is a plan. It's been in works for six months and we continue to update it as guidance changes. Stakeholders were involved and there were many moments we did not agree. We worked through it and I'm grateful to PVUSD, the United Parent Council, the PD Principals Group and the Central Office Administrators for giving up so much of their summer and fall to do this work. Please honor it. Please keep all of us accountable to the plan. Please hold everyone accountable for the promised supplies the one strike rule on refusing to wear masks and the quarantine protocols. If you cannot, I don't see how you can count on teachers to do it from the trenches. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seat. Does any member of the board have any, <coughs> excuse me, comments or questions? Well, um, Mrs. Greenberg. Dr. Skidmore. I, I realize we've talked about the survey, but I thought we, this was the time we were going to talk about the survey, so I'm prepared to talk about the survey right now. Uh, first of all, you know, I, we talked about calling it a survey or a questionnaire. Uh, I think we need to, to do uh, something else, call it something else. It's called you're either in or you're out. So you have to say, I'm going back to school or I'm going to stay home online, period, because we're not going to shift this, I don't think, unless you just intend to shift it at the end of the first semester, that you can, you can make a different choice. But we have to know, because we have some of these classes here that are totally unbalanced, and it would be totally unreasonable to expect a classroom teacher to teach both to the class and teach in PV Connect. At this, you know, simultaneously, because in one of these situations, 40% will be in the class and 60% will be at home. Well, that's not going to work. Not long range. That's too hard of work, particularly at the elementary level. Maybe it's doable at the high school, but I can't personally see how it's possible at the elementary school. So I think that that's one thing we need to know is who's coming back and who's not. And I do believe that teachers shouldn't have to do both. I think it's, there's a way to work that around that. I did say last Monday night or on Monday night that yes, this is a weird year. And we may have to reassign students um, to a different teacher if they don't fit right in the plan here or, you know, we have an unbalanced number. And then my last comment, and since everybody's made a statement, I'll, I'll make my statement now. Um, and I'm going to change it because most of you have all talked about what I was going to talk about, but I have one more thing. <clears throat> the holidays loom. December 25th is less than 100 days away. Some national health models are predicting a spike in COVID cases in mid to late January. If that happens, our schools will be ordered closed again. Thus, before we vote on this, I want everyone to realize that reopening is temporary. For it to remain intact until the conclusion of the school year solely rests with all of us. And with our right to go to school,
comes responsibilities. And to, to paraphrase an old Native American saying, we have a responsibility or an obligation to our past, our present, and our future. And if Paradise Valley schools are ordered closed again, we will have no one to blame but ourselves. Mrs. Case. Um, I want to thank the president of the Teacher Association, Susie Seat, for those words. I appreciate them. Um, I am a person who truly appreciates teachers, have for years and years. I think what they choose to do with their life is magnificent, and I, um, I truly do appreciate teachers. Along those lines, um, I think, as she mentioned, the district has an obligation to fulfill having the cleaning supplies and everything we can have in place. We cannot social distance in our classrooms. It is not possible. But we can wear masks and we can clean areas as much as we can. We can, there's a lot of things we can do. We can't social distance. Um, so I have some different ideas concerning the timeline to return to school. Would now be an appropriate time to say that? I believe this would be the time to say that. Okay. So thinking outside the box um, and having had seven children go through kindergarten before, they often would have a reduced time at the beginning of kindergarten, the number of hours. My daughter in California, they have the first six weeks be half day instead of full day. So the kids get used to that, et cetera, et cetera. So there is historical time for it. I suggest that we bring kindergarten students in for a half day starting October 1st. Split the day into half in the morning and half in the afternoon. I don't know how, you, this is just thinking outside the box. Those children are behind in their educational pursuits. They need that time to catch up, that they need that time to learn how to follow the rules, wear a mask, all of those things. And they need to become acquainted with their teacher, person to person, how we do things. And I just think, so there wouldn't be online for the other half at home, but I think we could do half and half and starting October 1st and have them go for a week before the other children come back. I wanted to start K3 for everyone on October 1st. Um, that is not what has been suggested here, but I think at least for, for kindergarten that needs to be done. And, um, I don't know how you work out transportation. I don't have a clue with all the details of how it happened. But educationally, I think that would be a good way to start the year for those children who have been online and have not had a good educational experience, not from lack of teachers trying. Uh, I have tried teaching multiple grandchildren at the same time. It's very difficult. Um, I, if, so the teachers have done everything they could. I would never say that teachers haven't done a job, but I have also received letters from kindergarten teachers saying they want to be in the classroom with their children because there's so much more they could do. So I want to give them a little extra time to do everything they can as soon as they can. And many of our letters from parents have come from kindergarten uh, uh, parents of kindergarten children and so that is my suggestion there and I just have to say this I'm very concerned with high school I don't know if we can have 2,000 3,000 students at high school at one time I I don't know how to handle high school I truly don't I know they need to be there 
I don't know if it can be an AB schedule. I have no idea how to have in high school. That that picture of hallways in Georgia has just stayed in my mind of all those kids not wearing masks, crushed into those hallways in high school. It's just a germ fest. I have many grandchildren who are high school students and I look at their Instagram posts and I go, really, you're doing that? And I'm just shocked. And I love my grandchildren, but their brains aren't fully developed. And, and so I, I am concerned with putting that many high school students together. And I, we have talked about um, um, stairs going up one direction and coming down the other. That will help. But I think also in high school, we need to have one-way direction um, hallways. I don't, um, it will be inconvenient. You might have a class in this room and next door to the left would be your next class. Well, that's just tough. You have to go out the door around the building and come back in the other door to go. I mean, there has to be some inconvenient protocols put in place to make high schools a little safer. Um, that's all I have for now. And if I may, specifically with the one-way hallways, um, that is, I know, something that uh, working with Mr. Long, we are, you know, all of our secondary schools are looking at implementing because that will, of course, help the flow and make sure that we don't have, yeah, that picture in Georgia stands out in my mind too. Although I think the biggest difference too is they were not enforcing masks. We will. Right, yes. Oh, that, Nancy, I'd like to just point out that your concerns regarding that number of children in or students in high school and consideration of a different schedule probably should have been brought up at our the previous discussion about changing metrics and whether or not we were in a hybrid model, because that represents a hybrid model. So I just want to point out that. It's always just, hard to know when to say what but I and, and I'm not saying it's not a valid I'm just saying I, I, under, I, to, well, I understand that yeah. but I I mean it might have to be that we have to make some shifts this whole pandemic shows us we have to be flexible and I'm bringing that up as a flexibility choice that we could do so uh, I, we have to be able to be nimble on our feet to get through this and have our students, our children come out educated, well adjusted. We just have to be nimble is my point there. Mrs. Baker? Yeah. Mrs. Matura? Um, I have a few things, but I wanted to address the, the calendar shift the way that um, Mrs. Case that you're looking at, I'm looking at my calendar right now. And to, in order to do bringing back some kids on the first, um, it kind of messes with the idea that the fifth, sixth, and seventh are going to be those all staff training days um, and the asynchronous days in order to get all the staff trained on the protocols so we can be ensuring that um, everyone is aware of all the protocols, how they actually work, how that everyone can feel comfortable with being, being back knowing what those protocols are. And I know those were set aside for the fifth, sixth, and seventh. So having the kindergarten teachers already in the classrooms without having gone through the training and having kids, I, I have a concern uh, with that. And if you tried to move those three days up, basically you're looking at that needing to happen kind of on Monday, like this coming Monday in order to not end up with um, so many days in a row, you have the three days off kind of in there where there's going to be no teaching instruction at all. And then you need the three days that's going to be asynchronous. And so having those separated, I appreciated that for the calendar. Um, so that's my concern with looking at shifting the calendar dates. Um, I, I appreciated the concept of that the first day um, especially uh, in the youngers or day or two um, is going to be a lot of things that are not going to be um, applicable to the PV Connect students that day. Um, 
and looking for an asynchronous day for those kids, I, I, I do think is a good thing to be looking at um, because they're not going to get a lot out of sitting and staring at their screen with the kid, kids in the classroom watching them at the sink um, and, and learning all those protocols. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I appreciate that the training for the staff, I know there's going to be comments that staff could have been trained earlier. However, my belief is that these procedures have been honed and um, as we get closer over time, it wouldn't have made sense in the summer when we were trying to get them trained for what PV Connect looked like. Um, and it makes sense for them to be training uh, with what our processes are in place at the time. So I knew that that needed to wait until right before going back to school. So I understand that. Um, I do, I had a couple of questions come up and I just wanted to confirm them. Um, I know there's been uh, concern that our nurses play such an important role. And if any teacher needs to, you know, have a student evaluated, there's, you know, for any number of reasons, the nurses are trained on all of the different reasons of why students need to go home or, you know, or, or who needs to be contacted and that sort of thing that all falls on nurses. And there will be times where there's not a nurse in the building, in which case the backup nurse in our schools are front office staff who will not be as clinically prepared to answer all these questions. So I do want to confirm that there's a backup plan. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Matura. Yeah, I mean, so one of the practices that we have in place, um, I, I remember even in my days as a principal in other places is, uh, you know, they have kind of that uh, buddy system, if you will, where, you know, they can call another school that may be right down the road and receive assistance from that nurse that is there. So in those cases where a nurse may be out again, just might be out for a day for whatever reason, um, then, you know, we would rely on, you know, a neighboring school to assist if there were some specific issues that came up specifically with COVID, for example. Okay, so the front office staff would not be the picture where they're going to go in and have to now make uh, contact tracing phone calls to families or anything like that, that will still be done by our nurse professionals. Yeah, that's that's my understanding, too. I'm going to look over to Dr. Jarris has given me a puzzle book, maybe, but if you're going to answer, you got to come up to the podium, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, you, you kind of started there. Uh, was your question specific to the actual calling of families when there's a notification or when there's a case that's happening in the classroom? Kind of everything. I just know that a lot falls on that front office staff to act as the backup nurse and to act, ask them to act as the backup, like contact tracing person too. That that is a little overwhelming, and I wanted to make sure that it is medical professional or nurse professionals who've been trained on that, who is the one reaching out to families regarding COVID, that sort of thing. I wish I could give you specific answers of what that would look like, other than to say that our, our office staff and our nurses typically work together in a team with regards to what are those duties and non-duties and which would be appropriate and not appropriate. So uh, I could not tell you at this exact moment which ones would be the backup nurses' duties versus the in-person nurses' duties, but I do know that that's typically how they operate in terms of what is going to be the most appropriate uh, action for which person to take. Okay. I just want to make sure there's a process in place because we are relying on our nurses so much this year um, in all the specifics that uh, just want to make sure we did have a process for that. Um, another thing that I've asked uh, Dr. Welsh about is that there it looks like there's going to be a lot more Wi-Fi use in the classrooms this year. Um, and we have had, uh, I, I had confirmed that um, our bandwidth had been upgraded uh, lately, think, uh, and just wanted to just make sure we're set with that. Yeah, I, we, we uh, confirmed with our technology with uh, Jeff Billings there that, um, again, not that we would be suggesting or recommending that every student while they're in person would be all on their you know laptops streaming, for example, because obviously that kind of defeats the purpose. But Yes, our network is capable of handling all students on devices simultaneously. They have the switches, routers, and bandwidth to accommodate that. Thank you. And I also wanted to confirm that when the when we're talking about using the PV Connect model, we're talking about that now shifting to the PV Connect 
um, bell schedule will now align with the in-person bell schedule, not the opposite direction. I know there, I had seen some confusion about that, that when that now the students learning from home on PV Connect will now follow, follow the traditional bell schedule of the school where they attend, which will look different from the way they're attending PV Connect now. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, one of the things, it, it doesn't look, uh, I, I would say, a whole lot different at this point with what's happening primarily at our secondary level. Because, if, again, if you recall, our minutes at secondary it is pretty close to what that bell schedule looks like already. I think the bigger shift will be at the elementary level. And so, you know, we're still trying to be very mindful about the screen time of those students who are in the PV Connect model so that there will be opportunities during the day for them to be able to still do some independent learning things, much like you would do in a regular classroom, you know, pre-COVID, um, where, you know, they'd be able to work on some assignments where they're not necessarily locked into that screen that whole day. But yes, that, that day is going to now be a longer day. So there may be, um, you know, more interspersed time on the computer than currently is with the current PV model. Okay, a couple more, I'm sorry. Um, I also did want to confirm um, that, or, or ask that it seems like um, attendance kind of looks a little different on PV Connect uh, than it will in person. And now uh, moving those PV Connect students to being more in line with the in-person that the expectations would be that the attendance would be kind of tightened around that and uh, any grades and expectations about when things are turned in now that we're were in person that those would be following the in person guidelines as opposed to any any adjustments that were made for the PV Connect that PV Connect now will follow the in person rules as well. Yeah, I mean specifically to the to the point about attendance. Yeah, so we are um, you know going to be updating, and I know Dr. Corson's uh, developing along with uh, you know Dr. Jarris and Mr. Long a document that we'll be able to share with our, our teachers and our families in terms of some of the FAQs about that. Um, with the attendance specifically, yes, it'll uh, look different. I know our current attendance, uh, you know, is really structured for that PV Connect. It's going to look um, much more like what a traditional uh, system looks like for attendance. So, you know, at the elementary level, we typically would take AM and PM attendance. Um, that's what we're looking at, you know, again, whether it's an in-person student or a PV Connect student. And then for our um, secondary students, um, you know, it's not just that they're logged in for the first five minutes or something like that. We are expecting students to be there for the period. Um, again, recognizing that there may be instances where there may be connectivity issues and things, and we're not going to hold that against students. But um, the expectation is that they're there for that full learning period. Thank you. And I did want to second something that uh, President Greenberg did say in her statement earlier, that it is so important that everyone has the assurances that we're going to be following that PV prepared um, plan and the safety protocols and everything. I think that is such a huge piece in keeping it, in allowing the um, our staff to feel like we're committed to this is what is being done and our families to feel and understand that they know what what is going to be done and that these are the standards that that uh, will be in place. And uh, I so I appreciate um, President Greenberg saying it. Also, Mrs. Seep also uh, called. Uh, talked about that. So um, my final comment question is because of the uh, the way the model is that we're, we're looking at with the PV Connect uh, balancing with the in-person, uh, would this allow our students who are not ready right now to return to school because they prefer the metrics to be different than what we've set today? would allow them to remain on PV Connect until a point in time where they would reach out to their school and say, we are ready to come back now, or as opposed to locking them into this for an entire quarter, um, because we do have the flexibility if, if students are uh, needing to quarantine at home, they'll be able to be learning in the same classroom. Will we allow that uh, those students to be able to remain home for a while longer and then return after speaking with the principal? Yeah, I, I believe that's possible. Um, you know, one of the things I know we have to be mindful of in all of this is, you know, because we really don't know what it may look like in terms of potential cases out there with COVID-19, that there is, um, you know, there may be the need for some students who perhaps are in person to have to quarantine for a period of time, which means they would go back to that PV Connect model. Um, and I think much to your point, conversely too, if we get to that point, um, you know, where things have been running for a while and families are starting 
to feel comfortable that maybe you're in that PV Connect model to be able to return to it in person. I think that's something we could accommodate. I think one of the things we just need to be mindful of is it's certainly not a, you know, hey, today I woke up late and I just feel like, you know, doing a PV Connect model kind of thing. You know, I mean, I think there has to be a methodology and a communication to that. And we'll work through those details. But um, yeah, I think that is something where, you know, we can certainly work on, you know, what that looks like in terms of being able to transition folks, particularly back in if that's what they're looking at. Thank you. Ms. Bacon. Okay. Um, I, I just have a couple of statements. I don't, they're not really questions so much, but um, I think one of the challenges that we have is, you know, I've, I've gotten, as I think other board members have as well, reports of staff who are currently in our schools not wearing masks. And so I think we need to develop some sort of protocols, not just for our students and families to understand the implications of not wearing a mask, but also for employees to understand the implications of not wearing a mask. Um, I also am um, wondering what I would like to see soon, our uh, plan for notifying families of active cases and how that will be handled um, and what would trigger a quarantine of a classroom, what would trigger a quarantine of a grade level or of an entire school. I think those things have to happen. And um, that's all I have for now. Thanks. Um, Excuse me, we may just take your check on that for a minute. That would also include shutting down sport teams, sporting teams too. Yeah, and if, and if I may on that, Dr. Skidmore, um, and again, because it may not be out there um, too widely publicly at this point, because uh, I think it was just yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Boy, again, COVID time, you kind of lose track. Um, it was just yesterday that the AI announced uh, a change in their metrics for um, participation in actual athletic events. And while they did change those metrics, they continue uh, to request that, you know, districts remain, uh, you know, confirmed to follow those those metrics as outlined for the AIA. So I think to that point, I mean, that is that is our plan as well. And I know even at the 75 per 100, which is where they set it for games, if we're not there, you know, we, we can't play. I mean, we're going to follow those guidelines by AIA. Mrs. Case. Thank you. Susan, as with this board, as always, we have lots of disagreements. And I, the kindergarten teachers always have approached how they take kids to the lunchroom, how they have their own playground. They have always been different than the other students. And so the protocols, some of them, of course, will align with those, but I think it would be possible to have a written version for them or teaching online or something. I just think it's vital for these kindergarten students to get back into school as quickly as we can. And we're a very large district and that's a blessing and a curse both. We, we need to be able to be flexible sometimes more quickly. And I think this is something we could be flexible if we wanted to. And if we weren't just looking at this massive ship turning in one direction, um, we could be flexible in this and, um, principals could reach out to kindergarten teachers and say, is this something you want to even, maybe they're not interested in it, but I believe they would be. And I want to be able to have that opportunity for that discussion. I just think it's vital. These kids have lost a lot of education, not because the teachers haven't been trying, just because of the difficulty of doing it online. So that's my comment. And I hope that teachers, principals could be asked the question, is this something you're interested in? So, thank you. Can we address whether that, I mean, that's basically saying to a group of our teachers that they will be treated differently, perhaps. Can we address that? I, I can talk a little bit about it just based on the, the conversations that we had with um, our principal groups and with PVA um, Wednesday specifically in terms of timeline. Um, I know there were um, the topic at least of um, 
kindergarten coming, uh, you know, earlier in dates um, came up. Um, again, as I shared earlier in the presentation, I mean, there was, I think, pretty solid feedback from both the principal groups and the teachers groups to remain committed to that time frame that we've established, which is why we outlined it the way that we that we did in the recommendation. Um, just the amount of, uh, you know, to get all of that. I mean, basically, if you're starting on the on the first with kindergarten, those three days are really starting next week. Um, I mean, it's just a very, very tight time frame. Uh, principals are not going to be able to, they'll have to now do two separate trainings for different groups of teachers. There was, it was not something that was um, felt that was going to be um, doable and supported by both groups. If I'm speaking, you, I know you guys are sitting in the room, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. If, if there is support after this idea has been brought forth from the community, will you listen to them? If, if, and not, not just from parents. If there is support from teachers and principals saying, yeah, that could work. We can make it work. Is that a possibility? Yeah, uh -huh. see, that's not your call. Okay, that's not my call. Okay. Sorry. And it also sounds like that was just answered. But doing trainings at different times, it's, I mean, correct? Mr. Weather was going to say that. It makes it very difficult, yeah, to do that at two different times, especially considering the scheduling of everybody. Okay, thank you. I have a couple questions if no one else does. Um, we discussed the, um, we discussed that, you know, there will be training, professional development training on health protocols. Um, so I'm coming out this using, using that. Um, I remain extraordinarily concerned um, about the amount of um, sanitizer, soap, et cetera, et cetera, that we do have and that we need. And I... I would like to know how we're addressing that. I mean, it does sound like we do have some teachers already back in classrooms, specifically Roadrunner and some of our others, and they need even more enhanced PPE than some. And, and you know, we've been hearing from many people, and I'm getting the impression that um, if a school has something, it's the teachers don't necessarily know that, but I think in this case, it's more like they're just not sure it's there and they're not sure it's coming. And I know when we discussed this on Monday, you know, Mrs. Belton, you assured us it was there, um, but I, I think we need to have a, a, a very clear list of what is, where it is, what more is on order, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know which one of you wants to address yeah, and, and if I, yeah, could President Greer, and I, my guess is that maybe everybody hasn't had a chance to see. I know I shared some information earlier this morning on that. I mean, again, prior to our meeting. So, you know, my guess is people may have been otherwise occupied um, and we'll just, we'll continue to update. Um, I think I heard that very clearly from um, board members in terms of making sure we're staying up on that. But um, there is, uh, I believe, you know, ample um, PPE sanitizer um, being provided to schools. You know, if there's something that for, for whatever reason we are hearing that isn't getting there, um, obviously we'll work on that. And we, to my knowledge, and again, Ms. Felton, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, we're not seeing shortages of being able to access any of those things at this point. Um, so if it is just a question of somebody needing to ask someone at their site to say, hey, I'm out of soap in my room, you know, we'll make sure we, we get that. But, you know, go ahead, Ms. Felton. Uh, so the list that did go out um, either yesterday or today, I don't know when it actually went out. And um, we do have three to four times more available in the warehousing currently 
and those items that were on the list were not seeing a large um, runtime to get like we did initially in the summer. Everyone was first frantic. We are not seeing that right now. The other thing we're starting to do also is to kind of monitor. Um, we had to make some assumptions when we placed our initial orders. And so we're going to be really monitoring that closely. But there is, you know, in fact, I think I told you at one of our summer planning meetings, we were having a hard time getting disinfecting um, solution at that point in time. We're not having that problem now. So we're really not seeing that at this point in time. Um, in terms of what's going on in the classrooms, I, I do think it's going to be part of the staff learning on, you know, if I'm out of soap, how do I request that? Getting the custodians in gear to, you know, um, the day, day porters are not in, for instance, one of the things the day porters are charged with is stocking the supplies in the classrooms of things like um, soap and um, towels for um, drying their hands, those kinds of things. So Roadrunner is kind of an outlier in that area in that they're running a full program um, and they don't have currently have a day porter. So I, I think I think we're going to be okay. It's something we're closely monitoring and we haven't heard of anything we're running short on right now. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. So it's really now, and it's more a question of communicating out, ensuring everybody knows. So that's, to me, that's always been a key part of this. And can I just say really, let's just state it really plainly. If you're a teacher in a classroom and you don't have soap or you don't have disinfectant, you have to tell somebody you don't have it and it will be replenished. That's a yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Another one of our considerations was to allow time for teachers with children who may currently have them with them in, you know, to um, secure childcare. Are we doing anything to help support that? Uh, yeah, so I know that's one of the things we're um, looking at ties into the need for us to continue to provide on site support for those students that may still need it in requirements, you know, to meet those requirements of Executive Order 202051. So even with the proposed dates that you see, for example, um, you know, the October 12th, four through six return, um, you know, those four through six graders, we still need to have a place for them up through that date. Um, so we're going to um, work through community education to make sure that, you know, we either keep it at those sites or be able to figure out how we're dispersing out. And we know that will also include our, our teachers too. So we're going to work to make sure we have that available for our teachers, obviously, as well as our, you know, general population. The good news um, is, you know, in terms of those numbers for on-site support, um, as one might anticipate, most of those are actually at the earlier grades. Um, I have it on one of my pieces of paper here now, but I don't know which one I have it on. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you know, most of those are actually at the K3 level. So once K3 goes back, it reduces that load quite significantly. But we know we're going to obviously have to plan for those students in the grades that have not yet returned as well for, as for our staff. I think, didn't you say it was like 137 or something? For some reason, that's sticking in my brain. I think from, that's right, yes. From Monday, and I don't know why it's sticking in my brain. Um, I would also like to um, echo what Mrs. Matura said. I uh, do think it would behoove us to provide for asynchronous days for our kindergartners um, who will be remaining in PD Connect. Uh, I, you know, I, I agree. I mean, if, if the teacher is going to be taking his or her students to show them where they're going to sit in the cafeteria or show them, you know, what the hand washing stations look like, et cetera, um, I, I don't, uh, obviously the, the, the children online are not going to participate in that. And, you know, I don't want them thinking like they should be doing something they can't do either or, or be be upset that they can't participate. Um, so I agree. I think there needs to be a way to to support those kids um, so that they're either not just sitting there or they're not sitting there being upset they you know that they're home. So I think um, I I would agree that asynchronous for those two days um, would be beneficial. Yeah, and, and President Breber is certainly something we can work on with that. I, I don't think we even have to change what our recommendations are, but we can accommodate that in terms of our planning. Uh, I have a question. Ha the surveys coming in from the schools, have you seen grade levels on those at all? We were given by the school, but have you seen any? 
I'm just curious if there's more first graders or more kindergartners that are returning percentage wise. I'm just curious. Uh, I haven't looked at that level of detail. I don't know. I I'm going to look over here to yes. Steve and Andre. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Um, so if there are no adjustments to the recommendation, Dr. Skidmore, may we have a motion? So move. Uh, let's do this as a roll call vote. Dr. Skidmore? Aye. Mrs. Matura? Aye. Mrs. Greenberg? Aye. Mrs. Case? I with the comment that I still believe we should do something different and be flexible with kindergarten. And Mrs. Bacon? Uh, given that we cannot meet the requirements of a hybrid model as outlined by our both county and state health departments, I vote nay. The motion passes four to one. Unless there's any other comments or questions, Dr. Skidmore may have a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, motion passes. We are adjourned.